For eons, I have governed heaven and earth. Man or God, each is heard. Their anger, their pain, and in their time of need, I rise. Alona! Semi-final Saturday. I don't know if that's actually the correct term for it, considering how many sets we have today. Four best of threes, Masters, Day 7, and uh, a lot that's still going on. Only four teams left in the tournament now, and tomorrow is going to be the big event when finals finally does kick off for these. And, of course, all of this is powered by Prime Gaming. Now, this is something that, uh, well, if you haven't, first off, been listening to us uh, Guys, come on. You gotta you gotta you gotta open <laughs> your ears. Come on. Either way, we wanna say shout outs to Prime Gaming. Uh, for being the title sponsor throughout this year of the SBL, not just here at Masters, but the entire year. You've already seen what new games that you are able to get with Prime this month, but make sure that you're getting the most out of your membership with all of the other exclusive content that Prime Gaming provides. That You're going to have uh, not only the free Twitch sub every month, free games, free game content, free Amazon delivery, and a ton else. A lot of that stuff you're going to be able to find pretty much anywhere around your screen. I think there's like a crown up there that gives you a lot of rewards. And again, thank you so much to Prime Gaming for being the title sponsor here. My name is Gormizer, and joining me on the desk is going to be Mifflin for the first of four sets today. All and, that's uh, three. Eventually, we're gonna we're gonna only dwindle down to three teams today, but we are gonna be eliminating somebody, and we're gonna go through a, a fun path to get there. First up is gonna be the Bolts and the Kings, and later on we're gonna see the Titans, and the Dragons. Winners will fight. Winner of that third set goes to finals immediately tomorrow. Loser of the fourth set goes home. So if you're looking at this one, slice it right down the middle, left side Saturday, right side Sunday, and that is going to explain to you what you are seeing. Loser of match 34, they're out of there. Loser, loser of match 35, they're out of there. And the winner of ma you know the grand finals gets the, the best cash they're pricing. The they look better. <laughs> uh, they're the best team in Smite as of right now after Masters and on 9-5. And we've got some really hard-hitting teams. I mean, you could have taken this uh, granted, with some some alterations, I actually believe the Bolts uh, and the Dragons, if I'm remembering correctly, didn't make it to the semis at Worlds. But the teams, I know the Leviathans, uh, you know, were there, and obviously they go on and win. The Titans ended up facing the Scarabs during theirs. So a couple of teams that have been eliminated, but a couple of teams returning back to like the the semi-final esque nature and being in the top four. Yeah, in, in spite of some, I suppose, mix-ups and upsets throughout the course of this event. I think considering just the, the general pacing of Phase 1 and the, the power ranking of these teams, the four that have made it up until this point were probably the projected four. And I, I think that we're really in store for some high-quality games, especially considering it's a brand-new patch. We're on 9.5. Everyone has now had an opportunity to figure out exactly what works for them, how they want to approach this meta, and now it's all about adaptations and iterating on those styles, which means the games are just by rote going to be better. And so far, they have been living up to that standard. A lot of the question was, what were we going to see out of these SBL teams? Was it going to be similar to what we saw last week when the SEC teams were, were going through their gauntlet? Or was it going to be a little bit different? And the answer was a little bit of both, right? We, we end up seeing a lot, of, a lot of similarities in some of the high priority picks, and then some differences in terms of how the team compositions has been shaken out. And when you look at the Kings, a, a lot of there's a lot to be said about a lot of this team. I think, you know, you look the other day, I'm going to talk pretty easily about what genetics was able to do on that Ymir, but I think it's the, his partner in crime in the front line, it's variety that is going to be, I think, maybe one of the, the linchpins for this team to be able to find their success. Yeah, it feels like Variety has really found his home in 9-5. I mean, when I think of OG Variety, look no further than the Bologna on your screen. He's been playing this god at the highest level for some of the longest time in Smite. And, well, fortunately for him, Bologna is pretty viable here in 9-5. Has some pretty decent build pass. Can go towards Death's Embrace or Death's Toll if you want sustain in lane, if you want pressure. 
Golden Blade very quickly becomes an option. With all these auto attackers currently in the meta, they're having a disarm. Very, very strong, but that's not to say that he's only capable of playing one god. He's got a few. But the through line for Variety's picks are they're lane bullies. He, he wants to get aggressive in lane, yeah. throw his weight around, and then rotate out of lane generally around level 18. Whereas some of these other soul that we've seen in the SCC, uh, the Valkyries, as well as the Scarabs, I felt like their soul laners were a little bit more uh, farm-oriented. They, they wanted to yeah. sit in lane until level 20. Feels like Variety has said, hey, uh, I, I can still go over. I, I can yeah. still get involved. And <laughs> when he does so, this squad looks very, very strong. And I'm excited to see it because, you know, we just saw a highlight, and it was just a smorgasbord of warriors that, that came through. It's not even including a lot of the other, like the Guardians that we've seen over there, although admittedly over the last couple of weeks, I'm not sure I'm putting much stock in Guardian solo laners. But Agreed. even the Assassins, I mean, you know, is something that's always in the pocket here and that the Kings tend to come back to, you know, almost regardless of the meta. Is that Rata Tosker something that Variety likes to play? And, and while it might be a deep cut, it is something I think that, that gives Variety that spice of flavor for the Kings and gives them, well, I guess some more variety. I really don't like using that word when we're talking about the player, but either way, that is exactly what he brings. The guy he's going to have to deal with, though, Mifflin, is not one of those solo laners that wants to sit and level until 20. It is a, someone who, who wants to lane bully, who wants to fight, who rotates super early, as we saw yesterday. He's going up against Haddix here, and Haddix, again, eclectic god pool, win needed but we'll just play what is it, whatever's meta, and he's going to play it really good. Yeah, but I, I would argue that there isn't a whole lot of carryover between these two players' god pools. Even in the last six games, I think the only thing they've got in common is that Bologna selection. Yeah. And even then, I'm not even sure Haddix has played that within six. That might have been seven or eight games ago. Otherwise, it's largely been four Haddix, hyper-carry soul laners. Yep. Things like the Ool, the Bastet, the Osiris's, the Kleenas, where you can get involved, have a lot of damage output. Similarly to Variety, likes to play the lane bully and has been doing very, very well. Found it, what was it, a, a solo kill on first wave yesterday? Oh my god, I'm I forgot about it. I'm expecting some pretty oh high no. octane matches in the solo lane in particular, <laughs> which is something interesting. I, I hadn't expected to see a whole lot of action uh, in 9-5 in with the TTK changes, with the additional survivability of a, of a role that is already historically very survivable to have very much kill potential. But when Haddix is in the game, seems like you've got kill potential. Yeah. And I think that that honestly, it might even still be an understatement somehow. Uh, kill potential? Like, no, like, sometimes you just get kills. Kill like, likelihood. And yeah, it's, it's just going to be there. Uh, we'll throw out there, and maybe this is a mark against him. What was it, his phase one KDA when we were looking at it at the beginning of the day? The other day was like a six point something, and it's oh no, it's a 5.25 in Masters. Dude, oh. he fell off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just a trash player. They can't hold anything. <laughs> okay, hold on. No, I, yeah, this guy is just nuts. And again, it's so wild to think this is, what, a second year, right? Like, this is not, it's not like he's been around forever. He's just really good at Smite and really good at bringing exactly what the Bolts need. I, I am like you. I actually expect this. It's either going to be, it's one of two dualities, right? Mm -hmm. It's either going to be a very explosive solo lane itself or the wildest rotations in the world. Like, the team fights are going to have them. And that's at least what I'm expecting here. I guess we'll find out. Picks and bans, game number one. And the Kings are going to be first pick. This is where things get uh, even more, I want to say, muddied for us, Mifflin, because a lot of the, the top picks aren't necessarily, like, crazy high performers. Like, we're seeing a lot of Jingwei, a lot of Nemesis, uh, a fair bit of Yamoja that's been making it through because so much else has had to be banned. And yet they're not, like, overwhelmingly winning. It's just that they're the better choices. Like, they're, they're the safer choices, the way I think you should word it. Or yeah. I should word it. We can, we'll you word can word it. it however you want. We'll word it together. Safe yeah. for choices. Yeah, I, I think it is interesting that a lot of the hyper carries are getting banned out. So when you think of ADCs, Jingwei might be the top of that priority order because she's the only one that's getting through. Otherwise, things like the Artemis, things like the Heimdall at times are all getting banned. Even the ROM uh, seeing a lot of banned priority as well just because of those attack speed stims. Can't get an attack speed stim. Having an AOE stim for your auto attacks, explosive bolts, which synergizes very well with crit just going to feel very nice, especially when you're playing against Barracuda, who's got, what, 105 games on the god now? Yeah. That said, it's the Olympus Bolts who ban out the Jing Wei, won't have to contend with it, worried about the Kings taking it first overall, and I think they're right to do it. If Jing Wei is available, you can take it. She doesn't have any bad matchups. She's going to be able to play very safe in lane. Even if you are getting relatively bullied, her passive allows you to just head back to base and yeah. you essentially have teleport built into your kit. 
you're not missing out on any farm. And in a meta that is generally uh, lean a little bit more so towards the late game, confirming your farm might be one of the most important <laughs> things you can do in the early, and Jingwei just does it. Also, a fun tidbit to me, at least, coming into this one, is a lot more footage of the bolts yesterday. Granted, I'm sure that you're like, not a lot of time to study it, so the king's probably watching that while it was happening, doing whatever they can to, to make sure that they know everything about whatever team they would end up against. Uh, the king's played three games <laughs> on this patch. Granted, and it was a great three games for them, and they won all three of them, but they played three and only three. And two of them, they got some, some very specific picks that normally, I, I want to say, wouldn't stand out. And I'm going to mention this because they weren't picked up until the bottom two each time. And so if I can mention it now, well, there's just a Yamoja on the board. It's the new one, the Kali, something that we, we saw actually getting banned from them in one of their games because it ended I up being so powerful. Glory. Is the that victory. something that you think is like an easy fallback? Or is that like, is that like, are they the meta? Is that something that is going to be great for them? Or was it just... Luck of the draw, the first day they played, it happened to work out. Uh, I feel like the Nuwa in particular was a selection to have some pretty decent counter ah, matchups, hey. especially against yeah, gods like Ul. Spawn up the clay soldiers, you're really not at risk of getting hit by the Ul yeah. combo, which is in of itself just incredibly strong. Nuwa, very, very good uh, in these late game team fights where she's very similar to Ramen, that you mm -hmm. could just initiate the fight with your global ultimate and remove upwards of 30% or even upwards of 60% of somebody's HP bar if they're squishy enough before the fight even starts. And that's the value of Nuwan. It's a god that Big Man Tings has gone to a fair bit in the past. Uh, but to speak of the, I suppose, eclectic nature of Big Man Tings' god pool, he's also playing things like the Persephone still. He'll go towards the East set. He'll go towards the Kakulkans. He's, he's not teams. really confined by what these other mid laners are, are locking in. And in an ADC mid-meta, or air quotes mid-meta, we haven't seen a whole lot of it from Big Man Tings, and he was one of the few to go towards Neath before ADC is really all that good in mid. So, surprised that he's straight away from that path, but maybe getting a little bit of it for himself here. The Kings lock in Chernabog and yeah. Olorun. Gotta assume one of those is going mid. It's so... In we're in such a weird time where I, my brain goes, well, we did see Chernabog solo, right? We like, did. And, and honestly, it won. And so he has that flexibility potential. And I think for a while there, we would have talked about how Chernabog is so strong, more than likely going into the duo lane because having that, that capability to rotate just feels like, hey, go farm over there. And then if you have to join a fight on right, cool, you're there in the blink of an eye. And yet Holer on mid has been really only, well, a big name stay for the Bolts yesterday, right? Yeah, he, ben he has was very, very large over there. So really either of them maybe being able to flex around there with maybe some preferences towards one or the other. The Baron Somity gets locked in there for the Bolts alongside this King Arthur. 78% win rate uh, last year when the Bolts were playing King Arthur. For a while there it was 100, and they only lost like four games on it. So he was able to, to find a lot. This is a good pick for Haddix. And it feels very early on, though, right? Considering what we know about Baron, and, and specifically what we know about Jake, I feel like this is more likely than not the support. And so something that they... they kind of heavily go for frontline and now get to build guys. their backline. Do you think that that's where it's shifted? Like jungle counter picks is not necessarily uncommon, but I feel like we've typically seen some of the others push down in priority. You'll grab your carries first, uh, at least in the first round of volleys. Yeah, so when you're in P's and B's competitively, you're always trying to vie and, and take position around the best selections. And right now we are in a hunter meta, which is why we see so much priority towards the hunters. You want to make sure you're getting something good for yourself. Surprise that the Bolts elect like to hold off until second phase of bans, but considering Chernabog's already taken, Artemis and Jingwei are already banned out, those are generally the Barracuda picks besides Scotty. And if the Kings are going to dedicate a ban to Scotty, then I would argue Barracuda got major value and maybe more value from his Scotty than he would have otherwise. So in holding off on that, may have restricted the Kings a little bit in this next phase of bans. But, but you're right to say that the Bolts have done a very good job drafting their front line. King Arthur, a great lane bully, going to act as a essentially a fourth ban towards variety of uh, King Arthur has been serving the Kings very, very well, and yeah. now will not be able to as the Bolts have taken it for themselves. And as you said, Baron Somni does feel like it is going to go over towards Awesome Jake, considering we've already seen a good deal of support bans. Baron Somni fits that role with relative ease and fits a similar style to what Jake has uh, very quickly made his bread and butter of, yeah. Nox. It's going to have that exact same root potential, great team fight presence with that AoE heal, a phenomenal ranged engage. I really like this draft from the Bolts, and it tells me that the Bolts already, with this core three, 
are looking for the team fight phase. They've got decent objective secure, yeah. but it's not really about that early game pressure. Thoth is so strong in these long fire giant dances and these mm -hmm. gold fury dances where you can just apply your poke from a range uh, against a double hunter composition. I think Thoth might be one of the best answers just because he's hitting you from further away than the hunters can get involved from. And it's something that has caused trouble for a lot of people in the past. I mean, what? We saw a Penta kill <laughs> him just last week. That's right. So it is something that uh, can be troublesome. The Kings having to play the, the weird game of, okay, cool. We took out the top hunters already. Uh, what do we do next? Like, who do, who do we just not want to play against? Charybdis, Izanami are the options there. So Barra going to have to reach a little bit Does he just deeper go into the pocket. Well, like you mentioned the Scotty. I was thinking like Hachiman has, Hachiman has as well. always been someone who's just safe. Well, we haven't seen Heimdall in a while. Uh, we're going to have to wait to find out. What if it's like Baron for Barra? I'd hate uh, that. I would hate that too, but yeah. I think it's a cool like name synergy thing i don't know we can ignore that nemesis locked in here we'll talk about that one instead because it's real baron akuda well like no because he could just then be barracuda but with like a b-a-r-o barracuda yeah all Bar right but you we you nailed say it, fast it enough it's barracuda get at it in the reddit in the comments if it is barracuda on the baron first off it's gore barracuda. is going fully nostradamus on the desk secondly great nickname <laughs> right like it, it only works also the there's no way that's gonna happen open. nemesis gets locked in to help counter out, well, right now, mainly the Emoja, but also just as no a top jungler. Mine. And is the Kleena and the Erlong Shin. We haven't seen him a whole ton. Uh, you know, well, admittedly, he had a rework, so he ended up disappearing there for Phase 1. And I think Inbound played it support. Uh, we did. haven't really seen it too much outside of that. I think a couple of solo lane matchups. But he comes through here, I guess, well, with the Kleena. Does he still have the potential to jungle? That's a better question than anything I was going to say. <laughs> he, he does. His ganks are a lot worse now. For those of you not familiar with the changes to Erlong Shen, no longer has a knock-up in the turtle form, gets additional movement speed from the mink form, and also gets lifesteal from his first ability, which has generally added up to an Erlong Shen that is more so about just very long boxing matches. The longer the fight goes, the more it's going to favor Erlong Shen as long as he's constantly hitting somebody. Whereas previously, when we saw Erlong Shen in the jungle, it was, hey, I'm going to turtle form. I'm going to auto cancel it. I'm going to throw my pin at him. It's a ton of bursts. It's a ton of CC lockdown. Yeah. If they survive all that, nine turns blessing. They're still here. And hopefully I've got follow up. Now that CC is largely restricted to just mm -hmm. the pin and the nine turns blessing, which makes me think Erlong Shen is much more suited for the solo lane. But considering we've seen Kleena solo so often, there is certainly some flex potential there. We haven't got a whole lot of data on Erlong Shen in the jungle, but I just got to feel like it, it fits Variety's uh, play style so, so well. I think the Kings will take it to the short lane. Yeah, and it's it's something that uh, it's just powerful. Well, well, I guess we'll see how powerful it can be right up against the King Arthur and how well it's going to control the lane. I can't believe, and this is more a, a knock on me, the, so he's the fourth most banned hunter. I'd have to go count uh, in terms of, of where he'd pick his, but Amuz and Cobb's been like, a high priority, and I don't know it, like if it's something that the Kings aren't worried about, or if maybe they glanced over him as quickly as I did. I mean, he's still susceptible to a lot of things, right? He doesn't move too quickly, outside of those hives, at least. And then so he moves real this quick. is something. Yeah, then he moves real quick and hits real hard. You got to be careful. But it feels like someone that that we've seen pretty high priority. It almost kind of catches me off guard now, realizing that Charybdis and Izanami were banned over him. Yeah, I'm thinking the Charybdis and Izanami band where the King's saying, well, he's probably just not going to play AMC. We've got a Yamoja who can lock you down very easily. Olorun, you don't really have a great answer to, to the Sanctified Field with AMC. Kleena's got great dive potential. So Leaps were, were essentially the name of the game for the King's second phase of bands just because they're, they're thinking, well, there's no way Paracuda, especially after the treatment he got yesterday from Kirmi, <laughs> is willing to play so an immobile bullied, hunter against a composition that's got great lockdown uh -huh. potential. But Barracuda is unperturbed. He, he yeah. simply does not care, or at least that's all we can glean from it, because he <laughs> yeah, locks he, in the AMC. He was waiting. He was like, yo, I'll get Heimdall or Hachi. Like, if they lock in a Vamana, I'm get anything that gets me away. <laughs> but, like, if, if he's not there, yeah, no Vamana? we're clean. <laughs> like, look, this is going to be easy. <laughs> he's going to stay alive. Uh, well, ideally a little bit longer. If you're a it's Bolts be fan, tough. we'll figure out, uh, I guess, how well, because it's looking like a very difficult matchup. Plus, getting uh, any late game team fight, if you're inside a sanctified field, you just feel so slow and that's something that we've we've talked about a ton and it used to 
at least what we were seeing around in phase one, Olorun, any sanctified fields, was typically answered with a Kamazots and a Cthulhu. The two things that could just go through it. Neither of those have been picked up over the last two weeks, and well, we'll see whether or not that ends up hurting the Bolts here as we jump into game number one of the first best of three of the day. It's the Kings, the Bolts, Blazing and Row. Thank you, Gore and Mifflin, and I'm super excited to see how these two teams are going to face off here. Game number one, as Gore mentioned, is going to be a big inclination of how the rest of this set is going to pan out. This is the pace setter, the first impressions that these two teams are going to get of each other from this tournament. That's right. It's been a while since we've, we've seen these two teams match up. We've seen a lot of Olympus Bolts against the Dragons. Those are our two top two of the league, I suppose you could say. But, you know, Kings are now rivaling that. They're pushing into that territory. So here they need to make, well, they've already made a name for themselves, but they really need to make a point, right? They need to say that, you know, we can play this meta too. We saw Dragons, you know, and, King and Titans, sorry, force a pretty, you know, heavy Hunter meta. And we see both teams kind of lean back to more of a, a traditional team comp. We still have, I guess, a Hunter mid, you could say, out of the Camelot Kings, but it is a magical one. Something Venenu actually has been playing as well, so certainly something they respect in terms of the god pick itself, but maybe, you know, we haven't seen Big Mentings play it too much himself. When we do get to that team fight stage, however, I think it's mostly going to be Kings with the objective DPS and maybe the pressure, whereas the Bolts will have a lot of hope based on that thought. And if they can pull somebody in with, with Jake on the Baron, then, you know, maybe they can end up getting a kill. Let's talk about the uh, positioning of some of these characters. Mifflin, I know, was uh, hoping, or rather theorizing, that Captain Twig would most likely be on this clear, and we'd see Variety take the Erlang Shen into that short lane, but it is going to be the reverse. Variety will be piloting the clear. And this is a very common tactic we've seen so far over the Masters two weeks, this uh, clear being really pulled into that soul lane. And I gotta ask, why are we seeing it this way around? Uh, I, look. <laughs> I think Erlang is kind of 50-50. He can be good in solo lane and, and, and jungle, whereas Clear, I would say, you know, maybe in 10% of the time is good in the jungle. Clean are just better with the wave clear. That ultimate can clear whenever she wants. She can build soul eater, the stacking items. A lot of the builds we've seen was like a, a soul eater straight into a transcendent, so double stacking, and sometimes into an Arendite as well, so just a lot of heavy power on this assassin, and she just gets to the backline without much percentage pen, I guess 10% on soul eater, and just hits the backliners, right? She just ignores frontliners, whereas, you know, if she was jungle she would have to hit the frontliners sometimes so might have to build some more percentage pen in an overall slower build also her gank's not the best not much cc granted erlang lost some of his cc no longer has a knock up just the taunt but he gained a lot of, of, of boxing ability. He's able to outbox pretty much anyone in the game. I've played the god itself, you know, a fair bit in duel and, and very different game mode to conquest, obviously. But when you're even with anybody with the right build, you can outbox pretty much every god in the game. And that's something we would normally say about Nemesis. She can outbox most gods in the game with that ultimate and that shield. But Erlang Chen will actually take it to Nemesis. So maybe that was in the decision making as well. I need something that I can box Lasbro with. So I'll take an Erlang Chen. It has decent gank potential and it has decent fight into the uh, AMC and the Thoth later in the game. And I think, you know, uh, combining that, or, or rather creating that, is the additional percent health damage that they, yep. they added to a steroid. It's going to help him do just so much extra, even in 9.5, especially where all of these changes to health have come. So there's going to be a lot more health for Captain Twig to start chewing through. A big part of it as well is the mitigations he gains on his one. So any target that he's hitting with his one, which is, you know, a, a stim on his auto attacks, will do less damage back to him. So if he can get a blink on AMC, for example, and get a couple auto attacks in, Erlang Shen will take a lot less damage in that boxing trade. But if he's, you know, if he's hitting Barracuda, for example, and Venenu is backing up Barracuda with that damage, he doesn't get that mitigation. So he has to be kind of careful, try to take 1v1s, and if not, just try to be ready for any incoming damage. He still gets mitigations from his ult either way, but one, you know, awkward, I guess, boxing scenario you have between the Erlang Shen and the Nemesis is that because he doesn't have that knockup anymore, it is going to be hard for him to take away that shield. He can only really do it with a long casting ultimate, and just a well-timed ultimate, I should say. Otherwise, you just have to take it off with damage, and, and that's where you get into a point where Nemesis kind of does outbox you if she is getting good value out of that shield. For sure, but like, encounter that, we're actually seeing Captain Twig do something we've seen maybe one other time so far in this tournament, and that is building towards this Mannequin yep. Scepter. So, so far, we've mainly seen the Boomba's Hammer, um, a little bit of the Eye of the Jungle from these more auto-attack heavy characters. i got to ask you, Ro, what is it about Mannequins that's drawing Twig to it right now? It just shows you that he wants to get active in the early game. I would say Boomba's is better, but that doesn't come into play really into level 20, and that's a, a very deep into the game.
At which point, you know, Kings, the rest of their team comp comes online anyway. Mm -hmm. So if his job is just to get his team through the early game, then building mannequins and golden blades like he has, just being a fast clearing and, and, and very well boxing god, he can pressure the early game and buy his team a ticket to the late game. Because otherwise, you wouldn't see an Oleron stepping up like this too often up against a Thoth and a Nemesis. But because he has an Erlang Shen next to him, he can feel confident. And I think he can take that all the way up to the left lane at some point, but for now, this blue buff getting pressured out, blinking forward. Captain Twig already hits two people with that taunt. Lazra gonna take a lot of damage. The heals come through for Captain Twig, but Lazra hasn't really taken all that much himself. The pin isn't gonna hit on the mark. Lazra blinking away, but Haddix is still here. Metroid hanging around the corner. Did use that ultimate to try and come into the fight. Twig has to be careful here. The stun's gonna come through. Lazra's right behind him. Slice and dice is gonna do some damage, and there's the auto attacks to finish off. Blood first. Blood very first. well played by <laughs> First Blood. <laughs> first Blood, it's yeah. Very well thing. played by Addix there, and I think that's you know the luxury of having Sovereignty first item. Twig got a fantastic engage, a double taunt into a double root as well, I think. Got a good amount of auto attacks off and was able to get a, a great CC engage and able to get out with that uh, the total form as well. But it's just no match for a Sovereignty at, at five minutes into the game against a double physical assassin that we're seeing on Captain Twig and Variety. Even though Haddix ends up being almost oom there, that HP5 and that extra physical defense just keeps Lasbury in the fight. And they're able to win the, the long run, and that's even with Netroid flying over. So they flew once Netroid flew over to that blue buff, Haddix and Lazarus say, Oh, we have to back out. This is a 3v2. Turns out wasn't that wasn't that bad. You know, Haddix really wasn't in danger with that sovereignty. And then they could stop Netroid from backing as well as getting Captain Twig's kill. So I believe Netroid lost his purple. If not, he'll lose it now. No. I guess Genetics was able to defend that purple on, on his own because Jake and uh, Barracuda were over there, so it's surprising they didn't get to invade that purple. So not too bad of a rotation for, for Netroid. And that's, you know, that, that's going to be really good for him. Luckily, as you mentioned, Genetics on this Umoja has a lot of disruption tools against Awesome Jake and Barracuda yeah, yeah. specifically can really push them out and make sure they can't come into these engagements at all. It's also scary for, for a Baron and an AMC especially to be walking deep mm. into the enemy jungle, you know. If you get caught out in either of those two gods, you're pretty much dead. dead. Yeah, yeah, not a lot of mobility on that kit, but we did see Erlang over the other side of the map, so it is surprising that they didn't go for it, but maybe big man teams was threatening the rotation as well. Right, he taking some damage here from Haddix, but that should just be a little bit of the poke game that solo laners like to play, so nothing really coming from that. Meanwhile, in the mid lane, again, just equal poke Venenu on this Thoth, able to just put out as much as that as he really likes. Although on the flip side, Genetics shouldn't have too much trouble healing himself and the rest of his team up when Venenu decides to get aggressive on that Twig. Nice try. Yeah, trying to... I like the idea there from Twig, doesn't commit too far in. Venenu charges that ultimate just in case. Captain Twig decides to walk up any further than he already did. We're already seeing a 1k gold lead on the side of the Olympus Bolts, and that is due to the first blood for the most part, but also due to stripping away that Scorpion. So both Scorpions, that means a, a decent amount of global gold. Uh, we're seeing 4 to 1 in totems as well, so a decent amount of global gold there. Jake may be in trouble here. That's a lot of Good CC, old. but that's going to be a beautiful coffin from him to try and keep himself alive. But that's a little bit too much on the Camelot Kings here. And Awesome Jake's going to be the first one to fall. Lazra has made his way into this engagement, but that double dash, yeah. super, super strong. Able to save the life of the Nemesis for now. But Haddix coming in, double knock up there. And the up and down go Genetics, still trying to run away from this damage. But meanwhile, on the top side, Variety's made the rotation over as well, and Lazra's going to fall down. What a messy fight. Netroid did the second rotation at seven minutes, getting great value out of that. Barracuda just over there farming up his stacks, getting some poke on the tower, not able to help his team at all. So two to zero for the Camelot Kings. And I guess that mo mostly, yeah, in credit to, to Netroid flying over and then Variety getting a good pick on the back line there as well. And that's going to be a huge pickup for the Camelot Kings. They have been able to claim back a little bit of that gold lead. Still behind though, Barracuda is in the jungle by himself, but luckily for him, he had a hive there. Not really a lot of mana on either Captain Twig or Netroid, and they didn't really want to push up. Not a lot of ward coverage actually from the Camelot Kings here on that left hand side. So. Definitely a smart call from them to make sure that they're not going too far into the jungle. Jake, in the meantime, is going to take advantage of that, and he's going to steal a couple stacks away from this obelisk. That's really going to start building up the bolts to be able to pick up it. this first trebuchet of the game. And depending on how they use it, it could give them a lot of pressure. A good map play by Jake there to get some more global gold, because that seems to be the name of the game so far. It's global gold against you know global rotations of the Kings. So even though Kings get the upper hand of that team fight. Uh, Bolts still maintain their lead. 1k, you know, maybe lost a little bit of XP, I suppose, but still maintain their lead in terms of gold. That trebuchet goes into the mid lane. I don't think we'll see that be very effective at any point because I imagine Oleron 
has probably one of the easiest times against the Trebuchet of any god. Yeah, it just has truly an absurd amount of range, has the damage against yeah, yeah. it too, so I don't think that, uh, well, I, I agree with you, I don't think that Big Man Tings is too concerned about that middle trebuchet. If uh, the bolts even decide to play it, which they have, we're going to see Lazbro yeah, moving up enough. there, pushing it down the lane. It's At this point in the game, I think it's a little too early to start stocking them up, right? you got to try yeah, and use yeah. it just to put a little bit of pressure. And to be honest, Oleron's only going to get more damage, so you may as well yeah. send it now while he will maybe struggle with it a little bit. It might take 10 auto attacks instead of more. It's probably actually more than 10, but you know, later in the game when he's critting a lot, he's going to clear that thing super fast. So it may as well at least send it down mid. It might not get too much value, but it will take up some of Big Man Ting's time. I just think it's uh, striking the visual similarity there between the, the two ADCs at the moment. Barracuda and Netroid playing very similar looking characters with those skins. It's yeah. it's almost spooky. I, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell. Well, I'm surprised not to see, you know, Barracuda's little picture on his on his chair today, so I guess they've taken it down. He is playing yeah. from home again. Um, I did hear him yesterday, he was a little sick, so but he seems to be playing quite well for himself. Absolutely, and well, Jake actually, hold on, Rock getting spot. caught out here. What a beautiful Rivers rebuke to stop the uh, the support from going anywhere. Metroid is going to get hit by Venenu's ultimate there, but it wasn't supercharged up, and Still only one and a half items finished up from the mid laner, so not going to do too much damage, and that's going to be another free kill onto Jake. Metroid potentially getting pressured out here, will lose his purple buff, but I think they're more than happy with that, especially for Ryde to find Venenu here. I think you'll just get some poke on Venenu, and they, I think you'd call that, you know, a trebuchet play. They just kind of had trebuchet pushing down mid and, and just went into the enemy jungle. Jake got caught on the way, but the rest made it to that purple buff, so able to trade purple for Jake's life, maybe not ideal, but trading a, a pyromancer for Jake, Jake's life, definitely good in the king scenario. Yeah, for sure. They don't they don't really mind about losing that purple buff now. Well, maybe Netroid's upset. He's like, I, I would have preferred the extra attack speed. But all in all, the Camelot Kings fairly happy with that. And this is a thing we've been seeing from the Kings fairly often, right? The, the bolts were holding not a massive lead, but still definitely a lead yeah. that... You know, 10 minutes into the game, you can't scoff at, and they've been maintaining that 1,000 gold since about five minutes. Now it's gone. And the Camelot Kings, yeah, they're, they've, they're really good so far. They've shown us some really good ability to hold on to themselves, let go of the things that they have to, and fight over the things that they can, and come back on top. Yeah, and we get to the point, you know, it's 12 minutes now, it's an even game, so now we should probably talk about who has the better late game or who has, you know, more potential in the in the mid-late game, mm. I suppose. And I would probably, as long as we get some big Oleron ults, which he doesn't have the mana for so far on this red buff, but Jake will back out, even seeing that Oleron hasn't got too much mana. He's sticking around a little bit, maybe a steal through the wall. Not going to happen, I don't think. So Big Man Ting is able to secure his own red buff there, and no problem at all for him. But yeah, he will scale quite lo well. I think Thoth scales quite well as well. Um, relatively even in the end game, it's just a matter of you know the Umoja walls. I think that's the big part of it. If they can find big ultimates, genetic scan, then that just makes Oleron's job so much easier, especially if you trap people in his ultimate. Well, just like Get this, Barracuda in some trouble, has to go all the way back towards his tormentors, the Camelot Kings up and down, and a beautiful Riptide from Genetics will claim that one, and almost as if listening to exactly what you were saying there, Ro, Genetics finds a beautiful Rivers Rebuke, forces Barracuda to come straight towards him and Netrioid, and there's no way out for the B in that scenario. And the guys on the desk said it well as well. They were talking about, you know, this 10th pick AMC, you know, mm. why did Kings leave it open so late? And it could just be that they didn't think Barracuda would pick it, because imagine picking AMC into this team comp. You know, <laughs> yeah. you have to play into an Erlang and a cleaner, and then you have to play into your Mojo walls as well. That's not easy. So he wasn't even able to get away, thanks to a great wall by Genetics, but that was a big investment by Barracuda. Both relics down, and all that really costed was two ultimates on the side of Genetics and Netroid. Yeah, and they're not going to be upset about that in the slightest. Now, the Camelot King is holding a small lead, but definitely still a lead in the momentum in their favor. I would say so, at the very least. Awesome Jake and Barracuda both have been very significant targets for the Camelot Kings thus far. And I think that's for good reason, right? Basically everyone, sorry, not, not even basically everyone, every single member of the Olympus Bolt has no way that's out right. of that River's Rebuke until the Phantom Shell is popped, which Awesome Jake has gone out of his way to pick up here nice and early. Although, Ro, I'm curious about what the second Glowing Emerald could be. I imagine a Shield of Ruth 
maybe something like that. Maybe, oh, he just wants the movement speed. Like, I think PBM kind of came up with this build. You know, you get the heal, get the movement speed, and that way you can chase people down with his ultimate. So it's good cooldown as well. It's about 2,000 gold investment, but no protection. So he's investing a lot of gold into that shell, and that delays his protections even more. And then buying a, an item that doesn't have too many protections. So he'll be relatively squishy for, you know, a mage as well. So if he can get decent heals off, that won't matter too much. But genetics, on the other hand, very tanky in comparison. Yeah, has the benevolence already, has the spirit robe for all the CC that the Olympus Bolts have. Uh, also has that Pridwin in the end as well. So using that Raver's Rebuke will give Genetics a huge health shield later on in the game. For now, it won't be giant, but still nothing to scoff at. Naturally, I could be getting ganked here alongside his support. Lazbra waiting in the wings, but there's not a lot of push-up here potential from Lazbra. He's just going to rotate back over towards the mid lane. Yeah, Lazbra and Barracuda, no genetics is there, but Lazbra's not even going to stick around because there's no chance Barracuda pushes up on his own while Yamodra is still there. So genetics knows that, just walks back towards mid, already did his job and got that dual lane pressure. Couldn't find the gank, and Barracuda's relics are coming up soon. I'm surprised that to see them taking this pass again. They did just know they were on a ward, but they bait Jake in. Really yeah, good. Captain Twig is going to get stunned out, but look so at Jake. Money. He has absolutely no protections. And down he is going to fall. River's Rebuke was not expended. So Genetics still has that, and there it's going to fall down, blocking off two members. Barracuda and Venenu stopped away from the fight, but BMT is going to get taken down by Haddix, who is now caught out in the middle of three, and his health bar is not going to last him much longer than that. Down falls the solo laner. And a two-for-one trade favoring the Camelot Kings thus far. Gold Fury potentially an option here. Still four members, and while they do lose the Oleron, Netroid is still alive. That's exactly what we talked about, Jake. No protections, really. Mm. And just that Thebes online, I guess his starter gets a couple protections as well, but that's nothing at 15 minutes compared to the damage that the Kings have. All they needed was an Oleron ult. They burnt through his, his shell in an instant and didn't even need to use Emoji ult. Barracuda is here looking for the steal away, and he's going to get it with the Swarm of Bees. Now Lazbra coming in with the double kill, helped out by his ADC. The Olympus Bolts take a bad situation, flip it on its head, and now Variety forced to run away. Has to use the Aegis, but is going to make it through the wall. The Nainu still looking for it, might use the dash aggressively. That's exactly what's going to happen, but... This is Captain Twig back here at the green buff, and that's going to be the all quits from the Olympus Bolts. But what a steal, what a double kill. Yeah, that's a huge swing for the Bolts, and now they get pressure to get the Pyroman through as well. So that gold going to be well and truly in their favor. I can't imagine Kings are too happy with that. I don't know, I wouldn't even say that Gold Fury was greedy, really. It was just, it took a while longer to do than they might have expected because of the patch changes. Although they've played a fair amount on this patch by now. But Barracuda may be getting a little lucky. I'm not sure what stole it away in auto attack, all those, all those beads, bees. But yeah, we'll get to see it again in a second. So. He walks up, you know, I guess Variety showing in mid maybe gives him some confidence to walk up. Genetics can't zone him on his own. And it is the, the two is the that steals. Yeah, yeah so a good steal, but I'm very well timed. And I guess you'd probably... You'd, I, you have to blame Variety a little bit for not being there if that was the target that was in mid. So he just had that confidence to walk up and no problem on the steal. Yeah, no, and it, it, I do love the cheeky kill that Barracuda actually takes the kill from Lazbro with the <laughs> bees ticking. He, deserves it. Uh, he absolutely does, yeah. Um, just I, I like that little interaction that he's killing there, but for sure. A little bit of misplay from Variety, steps into the wrong place, gives Barracuda that opening. And it's going to be a little bit of a head turn for the Olympus Bolts. They were looking a little bit, not down and out, but they were no. looking a little bit downtrodden, a little bit out of the driver's seat now. They've got that momentum back on their side. All in all, still a relatively even game. You know, a few kills in favor of King, but because of those objectives, Bolt's now in favor of the gold. You know, a, a big swing on the graphs, but in the grand scheme of things, not too much. I think either way, we're getting to the level 20 mark. We're going to get to these Fire Giant dances in, well, probably about five minutes when people get level 20. Big Man Ting's damage really coming online here. He's going to start critting quite a bit. Needs some more percentage pen, maybe, but maybe even not. He doesn't have to do much to shred Awesome Jake's protections, which because he doesn't have much of an on his own. We're seeing genetics a little far further ahead than uh, Awesome Jake because Awesome Jake has been dying early in these fights. So maybe genetics will get to that level 17 point faster than he will as well. I mean, even Haddix doesn't have all that many magical protections. Captain Twig, though, blinking into the middle lane. They find Barracuda, and look at that River's Rebuke. He's dead before he hits the water walls. Netrioid now claims that first one. Awesome Jake's going to fall down inside the Sanctified Field. Lazbro trying to make his way out on the back end. Right, he might chase that one down, but for now, the Camelot Kings looking to stay grouped up. 
And it's going to be Venenu, potentially the next target. And I think he should still have his dash available to him, but Variety's still going to hit him for a decent amount. Half the HP in the mid laner. Really well played team fight to, from the Kings there, just playing exactly to their strengths. They're surrounded on all sides, but they just sit in that all run all around that Yamoja. They're getting the bounced heals and shields, and they just stay grouped up and survive. Haddix, Lasbro aren't able to pick off anybody. They're looking at big man things, but you know he might have been half health before. He's, he's full health now. They have so much sustain and so much peel for him that he's able to just stay confident, do damage and just stand amongst his team and fight together as five. This team fight composition for Kings really coming online now. And you got to think, like, I'm looking at Camelot King's comp. I'm only seeing one character who doesn't have innate either save, self, or group yeah. heal, right? BMT and Genetics both have a heal for the rest of their right. team. Captain Twig has the big heal in the nine turns blessing. Variety even. Cleo has a lot of inbuilt ability lifesteal after coming out of a wall. So there's a lot there. Netroid, the only one who doesn't have innate healing in his kit. And even then, he's got the Devourer's Gauntlets at the moment. He's got Genetics and BMT around him who can heal him up. And he even opts for a shell as well. He's not afraid of that Thoth ult, I suppose. Not even the AMC Stinger. He's not going to Aegis the Lasbro damage or anything like that. He's just going to shell his team. So that just goes to show you that they're all going to stick together, clump together, maybe in this bracer that Genetics had as well, and just you know buff each other up. And that way, if they fight together, there's no way they feel like they're going to lose. And I've seen Genetics say similar things to that. Like That's his favorite way to play as well. If we just get to late, we fight together and play together and listen to each other, then there's no way we will lose. That's where they get their confidence and it seems like they're getting their game plan in this game. It definitely does look that way and looking at the comp again, Ro, there's a lot of area control here from the Camelot Kings. We've already talked about it, but River's Rebuke, yeah. maybe you know, top three abilities to, to control space and then on top of that you layer the Sanctified Fields which I would argue is the yeah, best if, space control tool. If I could ban one combo to never play against in my life it would be Oleron and Yamoja together. Yeah. I don't want to ever be a frontliner playing into those two gods at once because it's just a nightmare. If you manage to work yourself away, work yourself around a big Yamoja wall and then all of a sudden you have to deal with an Oleron ult as well, it's just so frustrating. Haddix in some trouble, Bead's already expended and the pin's gonna come out trying to continue that pressure but Decent King, commitment. Yeah, King Arthur is just too fast, too slippery, and the Camelot Kings aren't going to be able to get that one. They are going to force Haddix back to base, though. He does have the heroic teleport, so not going to be gone for long. The Camelot Kings still did have a small window there. No Pyromancer available for them, and they will lose the tier one tower in the mid lane to the Trebuchet. Interesting rotation. It just looks like they just had a burst of confidence there and, and wanted to try to force something, but Haddix just too slippery. They did get his bead, so that is something, but they just flew and, and rotated all the way over to the right side of the map when Gold Fury is the objective that's up first. So that gives Lasbro and Barracuda a chance to just start it on their own. They'll get it, no problem. So I don't think bolts are threatened at all in the mid lane here, as long as they don't push too much up further than the uh, Yamoja. It looks like Variety might go behind them engage them too. Potentially, but in all the chaos, Olympus row, the Olympus Bolts were able to pick away a Gold Fury, but two people caught out here in the River's Review. Phantom Shell already put for Awesome Jake is dead in the water, and there's the Sanctified Field. Haddock has to use that Enhanced Ultimate to use uh, to get that dash off and out of the Sanctified Field, but the Camelot Kings still pick up one. The Pyromancer definitely not off the table, but the Olympus Bolts do still have a lot of steel potential. Venenu has that ultimate, and there's going to be the charge. It's just all about waiting, but Variety's right here in the wall. Yeah, he'll peel, peel them off, no problem. Lasbro could maybe steal over the wall. It looks like they just want to fight as well. So confident, the Kings, right now. Twigs in a bad way, but able to use that turtle form to get away from Venenu's ultimate. No final judgment on Deep. the table for Twig, but he's still getting rained to damage upon. Barracuda steps up a little bit too far and he might pay for it with his life captain twig though he's gonna messy. get the trade out look at that captain twig picks up barra in a trade for his own life and now the bolt in I'd a good position to take the pyro yeah give that win to the bolts there i got a little messy on the kings pulling the objective dropping it trying to poke them trying to find engages but the reality of this team comp is yes it's incredibly strong with the ultimate from the all around and the emoji but when you don't have those ultimates available you're really actually not that strong so you have to get a big engagement reset, you know, play slowly, and then get a big engagement again when those relics come back up. But Bolts playing to their strengths well and the, you know, playing against the King's weaknesses very well. And that is the biggest weakness of the Camelot Kings. Cool no guys. real secure tool on the board, That's especially true. not one that can compete with both ultimate, that final judgment, truly an astounding source of damage that you can plant from I mean, just truly far away. Yeah, we haven't seen a huge ultimate yet, but he's had, you know, decent opportunities when kings group up like this. 
granted they are quite tanky with with the shell they have the emoji heals as well so maybe they're not going to be truly one shot but as this thoth gets more power and more damage online he is going to start to you know endanger the kings as well if they continue to group up like they have been but i think king's just learning a valuable lesson there we cannot fight without our big ultimates available even if that fight is relatively uneven we saw barracuda dive pretty deep behind that rock there and, mm. and twig trade out his life for him as well so I guess just, you know, maybe even a desperation play from Barracuda, you'd call that, but a very good one at that. Just seeing that he's strong right now and the Kings were weak in that moment. So finding a small opportunity there to, to get a win. It's just a Pyromancer in the grand scheme of things, again, not too much. Since this is such a back and forward game, even though the Bolts do have a lead despite having a kill deficit, it's not going to matter too much because Kings are just getting to that point of having this prow this, this team fight prowess. So as long as they get big ultimates from this Oleron, big ultimates from this Emoja, they will win the initial team fight, but it's the smaller scraps that happen after that is where bolts really shine. And we got to see Genetics get those ultimates again. You know, last time he trapped Haddix and uh, I believe it was... He hasn't uh, missed, yeah. I believe it was awesome Jake, yeah. Both of them were able to secure the kill onto Jake, but Haddix does get away there, and I think committing to ultimates, only picking up the support, it's not nothing, obviously, but it does leave them vulnerable. As you said, the Kings really need these big ultimates to be able to take these engagements, and Venado right, dashing trouble. in onto Variety. He could be in a lot of danger here, but off the mark is the ultimate from Variety, and now Venado turning around, but there's the River's Rebuke, forcing the bird into an even worse spot, but Variety now not able to catch up to him. That dash truly so far, and now Variety has to get out. The Aegis expended, but Captain Twig on the top side, able to find Venado, should pay for it with his life though, Barracuda yeah. trades that one out. Again, Twig just finding somebody in the back line, but a huge ultimate from Big Man Tins coming into this team fight, and a three-man knock-up too, followed by the Riptide. Damage is coming back through, and the Camelot Kings have realized they don't have enough DPS to take this fight down. But Lazbra's waiting in the wings, but Variety now looking to find something. Lazbra though clearly was not spotted out by Variety. The dash off the mark, Variety able to heal so much with the rest of his team in tow. So awkward right there by Kings just realizing they have no none of those big ultimates. Even a 4v4 situation where they have the sustain advantage, although Baron rivaling some of that sustain, Bolt's completely charging them down because they know they're so much stronger when those teamfight ultimates are down. They just need more valuable, more valuable ults. I think Genetics had to save his ult, had to use his ult to save Variety there from Venenu. But then, you know, Big Man Tings makes up for it with a huge ult. But again, we're seeing Twig just trade his life for somebody in the back line, whereas he needs to live longer. So maybe if he can get his ult off earlier in the team fight, maybe get that heal off after those mitigations and able to live after he kills Venenu in a situation like that, that would be huge. But we also need to see, you know, some better utilization of this Yamoja role. I think we've seen great so far in this game, but that one, not, not perfect, I would say. It has been really scrappy these last couple engagements. The Olympus Bolts backline step up, the Kings try and fight them, the Bolts get a kill, the Kings get a kill. It's all it's very, close. yeah, it's all very slapdash scrappy. I, I can't think of a better word for it at the moment. It's really going to come down to this next fight and, well, maybe not even then. The next secured fight. Yes, Whichever yeah, of these right. teams is able to win a fight definitively, maybe around this fire giant, which where is where all this posturing is currently happening. The Bolt's currently holding that positional advantage while the Camelot Kings wait for Captain Twig to get back, this is going to be a 4v5. This is the hard part for the Bolts as well. They know they have to fight around Fire Giant eventually, but it's so much easier for Yamoja to find big walls here. Already Haddix falling down low. Genetics just trying to put some disruption on the board. Jake caught out. Look at these Reptides. Three back to back. Awesome. Jake forced to use the beads. The Phantom Shell not going to save the life of the support. Now going on the aggressive Netroid up into the sky. Looking to find some extra damage. Barracuda getting crit there with the explosion. Netroid though is taking some damage from the Thoth. Has to dash into that wall to save his own life. But now Awesome Jake is off the board. There are still a lot of big ultimates from the Camelot Kings available, specifically Genetics still has the River's Rebuke and four members of Olympus Bolt still hanging around. We've seen this before though. Kings need more than just this support pick in order to pull a Fire Giant. Maybe they're even waiting for EFG at this rate. So they just go get the tower first. But again, they need to wait for these ultimates. Jake's up in 10 seconds, but these ultimates, I would say Oleron's ultimate, the most important one, not up for another you know, 50 or 60. It's going to be a while for sure. And hanging around the left-hand side here is Lasbra. Going to watch as the Pyromancer is completely plundered by the Camelot Kings. They do have to back away, though. The Fire Giant, way tougher than his younger compatriot there. So not able to pull it just yet. And we're back to square one here, Ro. Yeah. Back to the Fire Giant dance. Back to 
just figuring out where the next pick is going to come. But the Camelot Kings, as you mentioned, they need to translate this pick onto Jake into more. Yeah, almost available, or almost able to catch more. Netroid, a great ultimate. He flies in and then dodges the AMC Stinger as well and is able to get some crits onto Barracuda. But Barracuda, just a fast-moving god, able to mm. run his way out of there. Everybody else as well on the full retreat. It is difficult to ch chase into this team comp because they are generally quite long-range. And then the ones that aren't long-range, the Nemesis and the, the King Arthur, are very mobile characters both with beads as well. So unless they find a bigger ultimate than that, uh, well, I guess the Olorin ult was decent size and the Riptides were good, but they need a big Yamoja ult for sure. And that's what they're looking to find now. The Camelot Kings, well, Netroid on the left-hand side, but the other ultimate. than Netroid, everyone here on the Camelot Kings on that right side of the map. Same with the Olympus Bolts. And it's just waiting games at this point, Ro. Just waiting for, well... Someone to get a pick, him. someone to step out of line, some poke to come through, a tower to be pushed by minions, someone to have to, have to go to a different spot. So many options for openings now for both of these teams. It's just about who's going to slip up first. We're getting, you know, it's speeding up a little bit in terms of damage in this game. Netroid just finishing his death bring up. Big Man Ting's getting more and more power online, which means he'll get more and more crit and DPS. They're able to burn the fire giant very quickly. So if they do get a pick on Jake again and make some space, like maybe an opportunity here. Twig blinking forward into four people. Variety, sorry, Venenu, the one targeted it out. Look at the damage from Netroid. Down falls Barracuda. The Rover's rebuke comes through, blocking Jake. Jake's puff to the rest of the team, and he's going to fall before he gets up onto the coffin. Venenu now, the next target potentially. Lazbra holding around in this jungle, looking to find some trade kills. Captain Twig is going to spot him out and make sure he can't come into the rest of the fight too easily. But this tier 2 tower should be free. Variety hanging into the wall, spots out Lazbra, dashing through, just trying to find a little bit more space in this. Could potentially be this that be definitive fight to pull the fight. We also just hit the 30 minute mark as well. So EFG is up. It won't matter too much to Kings. They'll be able to DPS it down relatively quickly. But Lazbra and Haddix trying their best to defend. Look at the amount of DPS coming out on the fire giant. Haddix long. is really far up though. Has to use that ultimate. The pin's coming through, Wrong. but the dash does not care about your puny root. Captain Twig, though, has been left by the rest of his team, and he's going to fall down. Lazbra able to find that one. Now the fire giant too low to drop. They have to find it. Bolts, but yeah. once again, the bolts steal it away. I think that was an auto attack out of Lazbra as well. Just perfectly timed based on, through those crits from Big Man Tings as well. Veneno wins the 1v1 up against Haddix in the back line. I'm sorry, Variety in the back line as well. So isn't able to, is able to come back into this team fight, get some artillery damage off and chase them down with that fire giant in hand. And Variety is getting artillery. These shots from Doth so powerful at the moment. Haddix chases the rest surviving members of the Camelot Kings out and the Olympus Bolts walk away with yet another objective steal. But this time around, it will be the fire giant. And that opens up a whole map because it's not just regular, it's enhanced. That is a big deal for the Bolts as well. They have a decent siege comp as well. The, the struggle again is going to be that Yamoja roll, but yeah, hopefully we can see that replay. And, 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 and yeah, look, Lazbra basically able to chase out Twig here, and that saves Haddix. Haddix able to come back in and buy his own time as well. So once these two frontliners, I would call Lazbra a frontliner there, just getting involved in that fire giant, he's auto-attacking next droid, and then walks in just one auto attack as Crazy. well. That's all it took. Perfectly timed. Gets his damage off as well. No reason to, for him to live there. I don't think he could have anyway. So he just gets as much damage on big man things as possible. Trades his life for a fire giant and EFG. So well worth it. And I think that's the second time we've seen a jungler walk up to fire giant and yeah. steal it with an auto attack. Last week it was a Mercury. And now we see it being done by Lazra on the Nemesis as well. And the Olympus Bolts must be flying high after that experience. They won necessarily down, but it was definitely a, a power Bad struggle be in, yeah. between these two teams. It was, and look the graph re reflects that. Look at that, up, down, up, down. And I think that's a really solid basis to start growing this lead from. There are three tier twos on the map. Three Phoenixes still left to find. The Olympus Sports have a lot of uh, hidden gold still left to claim. And that could elevate them enough to be able to take these fights away from Camelot Kings more definitively. Yeah, I think the most important thing is for Jake. He's able to catch up and get some protections online. He'll get level 17 as well. Not sure which starter he'll go for, but he's actually a kind of a greedy support in the way that he normally goes for the Sentinel's boon. Um, but it works very well in situations like this. He doesn't have it yet, obviously, but if he was sieging with that starter upgraded, he'd be able to sustain a lot through the poke that um, Big Man Tings and Variety might have. So I think their sieging will be decent. They're just going to have to be careful, be careful of the Emoja ults, um, but they have at least one shell and maybe a second one as well coming for the, uh, the big walls. 
trying to push up now. Two tier twos have fallen, and the Olympus yet. Bolts have two Phoenixes exposed. The Camelot Kings have to try and defend, but it's a split pushed from these two teams. Vinayu charging this ultimate, just trying to see if he can bait anyone out, if he can find any situations. Genetics hit. Taking a little bit of poke, but at the moment, we're just waiting for these waves to push in. And Haddix already taking a fair amount of damage in the middle lane. Now we're seeing this wave in left. Venenu is caught out, though. And he has the beads jumping up into the sky. Netroid is looking to get aggressive onto Haddix. The damage isn't quite there, though. The ultimate from Haddix should save his life unless Lazarus. Captain Twig's able to find that pin. The taunt's good. Variety coming out of the woodwork to try and find him, but Lazarus able to find the turnaround. Captain Twig is melting, but so is Lazarus, and down he falls. Now Metroid claims first blood. Lasbro had to go in there to save Haddix in that situation. Haddix had no, almost no mobility left. He probably couldn't escape that Erlang Shen, especially with a cleaner coming as well. But I don't think he needs to commit as much as he did. As soon as he shows up, Captain Twig backs out a little bit, and they could have backed out together. So Haddix just kind of getting caught out there. And he was a, he was actually backing in mid, and he was, I imagine, going to teleport in with full health because he was poked out from that 2v2 in mid. Netroid, once Venenu's poked out, flies up in the air, and you would assume he was flying after Venenu, but he doesn't. He sees Haddix about half health in mid lane. He's backing. He walks, he flies over, catches him, and then is able to get a decent fight off that. So that's the EFG gone, completely nullified it. And we're almost back to square one. It is, you know, a sm very small, basically ne nothing of a gold lead for the Olympus Bolts. And we're back to a big team fight opportunity. And and remember, Kings won the team fights, right? Yeah. They just lost the, the Fire Giant due to a steal. So I can't imagine you're too happy to be in this position if you are the Bolts. Absolutely not. They weren't able to get themselves far enough ahead of the Kings to be able to really contest in these fights. Although, the big thing that's changed since that last Fire Giant is Awesome Jake. He's been picked yeah, up consistently. He's much oh and seven on the support right now. Jake has not had a good That's game. That's the way it is sometimes. Yeah, he, he's not, sorry, he's, he's not had a fun game, I think is the yeah, better yeah. way to put it. He's it, been the victim of the King's comp, for sure. in my opinion. Yeah, He can't escape, well, apart from the shell, he can't really escape the Yamoja ults, and then he can't really escape a Baron ult very easily either, because his ultimate, his CC immunity, is just being eaten up. He does, however, have the beads, and that helps a little bit, but now he's much tankier than he was, so he can afford to take a lot more poke here and be in riskier situations. Potentially, but look at this positioning from the Camelot King Awesome Jake it's once beast. again caught out by genetics. These riptides have just been deadly for the support on the side of the Olympus Bolts. Meanwhile, Lasbra has to deal with the Trebucket in the mid lane, and the Camelot Kings have a little bit more space to work with now. I didn't realize Lasbra had a Deathbringer in there. I imagine he just bought that after that last siege. So I, mm, I guess you know, he's going to roll that, that small percentage chance to crit and hopefully try to one-shot one of these backlines. Or when Netroid flies in, maybe he's able to one-shot one of them as well. Also, Envenomed helps in the boxing match if, mm. if Captain Twig wants to try to that 1v1 again. So a good choice, but you know, hopefully he does get those crits to make use of it. Trying to send some poke down range with the Olympus Bolts. Have maybe the best poking god in the game. Yeah. Venenu should be able to put a lot of damage down range. And Duel a little bit to the Camelot Kings before they're really able to posture up for this main fight. Although on the flip side of that, I, and I've covered this before at the start of the game, Genetics is going to be able to nullify most of that damage. When I looked at damage in the charts here on the bottom left, I expected to see Venenu way above everybody else and AMC way above everybody else. And they haven't done a little amount of damage by any regard. Mm. But Netroid up there is very surprising to me. He's having a great game. 8, 2, and 7 now, flying into the back line, consistently getting the kills when he needs to and being a huge impact player for his team throughout this entire game as well. We saw him fly to that first blue buff at like, what, five minutes? Mm. And then he was flying to mid lane at like seven minutes. So what a game he's had so far. He's really taking advantage of the unique uh, abilities of Chernobog, yep. right? Like how often do you see ADCs really use that kit to fly all across the map at every stage of the game? It just doesn't happen. And it's something that only really he can do Dropship out from genetics. It's going to force a little bit of aggression from the Olympus Bolts, but beautiful Riptide going to nullify out any of that potential chase. Yeah, Olympus Bolt's just looking for a catch there. I believe they saw Captain Twig back, so they try to catch Genex in the front line, but he's able to just escape. It's through that movement speed as well from Bracer. That movement speed plus the Riptide movement speed, it's really hard to, to get a catch on this front line. Venenu getting a decent amount of poke on him. Lazarus holding around the left-hand side. Haddix caught in the river. He's going to be able to get out just fine. Right, he is hit by the final judgment, and now Captain Twig in some big trouble. Old. Pull back in. Awesome Jake. Big Man Tings big is going to take that one, but he's falling down low in the sanctified field. Haddix able to find the first kill on that one. Lazra picks up Twig in the meantime, and now two people have fallen from the Camelot Kings. A huge swing for the Olympus Bolts. 
Haddix does have to back, and this could be some space for the Fire Giant to go down. Yeah, I think finally now, Bolts are in control of this game. They should be able to get this Fire Giant for free. I guess they were in control before when they were sieging, but that was nullified by a good pick on Lazbro eventually. Now they actually win a team fight. That's a huge boost to their mental right now. Able to win a team fight against this team fight composition, that is the Kings. I think we just didn't see a great genetics ultimate there. He, he mm. tried to catch out Venenu and just missed, was just off the mark. And then he only really gets Haddix, who his team really just... Can't kill. He, yeah, he, he can't kill. He can't die right now. He has too much mobility. As long as he has that beads up, he's generally able to spin around and, and avoid most of that damage out of Big Man Tings and Netroid. And as well, Netroid just wants to dive as well. He doesn't really want to be hitting a frontliner. So this should be a relatively free Phoenix. There's still still two people down on the side of Kings, and they're able to just walk over to mid now as well. Has that mantle of Discord as well. So Haddix right. truly yep. unkillable at this point in time as the Playing right fast. Phoenix falls down. Jake looking to pull back in someone. It will be Variety, and he's getting hit by all sorts of damage to beads. Forcibly, forcibly expended, and that's going to be Lazaro trying to find a little bit more. Kingslayer is activated, and Lazbra falls he down low. The pin's going to find him, and two people caught out in the river. There's the Sanctified Field. Awesome Jake falls down. Venenu falls down, and the Camelot Kings from a two Phoenix deficit win the fight and now have some time to clear it up. I gotta say, that's on the back of Lazbro. That is a big mistake on Lazbro. Not only walking forward at a, a pretty poor time when his team's trying to back out after two Phoenixes and the Kings are actually spawning, Captain Twig and Big Man Tings both spawning there, but he also Nemesis ulted into that Aegis of Variety, so completely ineffective Nemesis ult, and he has no dashes at that point and he gets caught out. His team tried to bail him out and get caught out themselves by a great ultimate by Genetics, and now all of a hey, sudden Kinect. this game is being thrown on his head. My gosh, Ro, I they think could. this could be an opportunity for the Camelot Kings to end. Three members of the Olympus Bolts have 20 plus have no second ults, cooldowns. They don't have ultimates, but it's only a ha Barracuda and Haddix here. There's a lot of damage on this Camelot King side. The Titan already falling down. Captain Twig looking to find the damage on the Barracuda. Titan at half HP already. And the Camelot Kings should be able to pick up that Titan, but the damage has slowed down. Variety able to find the last auto attack. And from the clutches of defeat, Come victory for and the Kings. And you can Kings. see in the cameras how happy they are as well. They were up against the ropes twice in that game. The enemy team had EFG. They never got EFG themselves. It was able to fight back both times, defend the base both times. That last fight on the back of a big, huge mistake on Lazbro, completely costing the game there. I'm very unfortunate for the Bolts, but I mean, very fortunate for the Kings as well. Having you know, their poor luck as well. They, they Lazbro, I guess the star and the ender of that game as well, stole the first EFG, but then unfortunately yeah. kind of threw it away at the end there. So an all over the place game for both teams were very competitive and great to watch. A big shout out to Netroid. He had yeah, a fantastic a game. game. Uh, I think he ended there nine and something, nine and so, two. Yeah. Nine and two Just a, a yeah. truly phenomenal experience and it really shows us the power of this Chernobog, why it's been so heavily yeah. prioritized. But not many people utilizing it as well as he was. For he sure. was flying in the early game. You know, normally you would say that god is a, a scaling god, but he was flying in the early game to, to, to two blue buffs, a mid lane fight, and then having the huge impact that he did in late game as well. What a game from him. Well, ladies and gentlemen, will the Camelot Kings be able to clear the storm or will the Olympus Bolts strike back? Find out after the break. Hold on, sorry. I gotta think about that. I'd say Mjolnir. I actually like the Thor films quite a lot. And you know, gotta rep Thor. Mjolnir, cause it's cool hammer and it's fun to say and it's cool armor in a video game. Excalibur, way cooler. Mjolnir, easy. Fan hammer. Excalibur, all right, one or two fun. <laughs> Excalibur is simply superior. It's a sword and the other one's a hammer and swords are cooler. Uh, Excalibur, just a badass sword. Excalibur. More English. Um, for me, it'd probably be Exc Excalibur. Being from the UK, Arthurian lore, just I prefer it. Excalibur. I like all the Arthurian stuff. Excalibur. Oh, shit. Easy. The what? Mjolnir or Excalibur? Uh, Thor's hammer or um, oh. Arthur's sword? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm Danish. Uh, I'll go with Thor's for hammer. The, yeah. Uh, Mjolnir. Hmm, I'm a sword guy over a hammer guy. I think I've got to go for a sword. I'm not. I'm just not. I'm, I'm more of a slice than a thump. You know, that's that's my best description. 
So Excalibur's only ever gone to one person ever, where Mjolnir, at least as far as like Marvel's lore with, with the movie franchise, has gone to two, which means it's no longer the one true worthy person to hold it. So Excalibur's obviously superior because only one person can have it. Big sword is kind of kind of cool. Probably Excalibur. Also a big sword, like Benny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know the lore behind either. I'm just gonna say Mjolnir. Sounds cooler. And I like Thor more. Yeah, I think Excalibur. Swords are cooler. A, an incredibly back and forth game. I mean, Mifflin, like literally 30 minutes outside of the kill lead, uh, you know, interesting things that happened there. Gold was equal. The game might as well have been just equal. Uh, and then there's a nice fight around the fire giant bolt steel. That one feels really good for them. And they go forward. They get to resurge. They finally win a team fight. They get a second fire giant, Mifflin. Uh, and then it just falls apart. It crumbles at the base. Yeah, I, I think to contextually, like, if I were to TLDR this game, yeah. it's King's in control. Kings drop a gold fury, get it stolen away. Kings in control again. Kings drop a fire giant, get it stolen away. <laughs> Bolt's in control. Flub a, a, an attack, essentially. Weren't allowed to use the guy on your screen right now, Barracuda, because every time he chose to get involved, he found himself in the yeah. middle of a massive river. And then the Kings in control and are finally able to win. That is got to be heartbreaking for the Olympus Bolts because you're essentially given like ideal circumstances. The Kings were dominating, and every single time the Kings went to an objective, it went the way of the bolts, and the team fight went the way of the bolts immediately afterward. But eventually, I think it really came down to just Barracuda's pick. This AMC yep. was not allowed to play, and the Kings were playing perfectly around him constantly in the team fights. It's Captain Twig blinking in, finding a nine turns blessing on either Ven or Barracuda. Generally, Ven, as it wasn't really Twig's job to deal with Barracuda because they had genetics on lock for that just about every single time. And the Camelot Kings with just phenomenal team fighting. Uh, Phenomenal mental game as well. I, if yeah. I had that many objectives stolen from me, I'm checked out immediately. <laughs> the Kings kept their head on their shoulders and were able to prevail. Well, and and you can see it here. I feel like there was a point I even made a joke. I was actually around the 28 minute mark in game. It might have been after that kill. Oh, watch this pop. Or I had just said that you know to me, oh my it god, felt like man, they are pumped and, and for good reason, right? But to me, it was so interesting because the dual lane for the Bolts felt like just a lightning rod. Like, if something could go wrong, it was happening over there. I mean, Jake's 0-8, Barra goes 3-4, and 4, Lazbra ends up racking up a, a few deaths there towards the end. But it felt like it, it was almost this, like, I'm going to fall on the sword so that you guys can continue on without me. Like, if I die, it's okay. Haddix and Lazbra and Vin can get something done. Unfortunately, it doesn't work the entire time, right? At the end of the day, you, you still need your support and you still need your carry. And some good damage output by Barra, 37,000, wow. uh, despite the fact that he wasn't allowed to do too much. And, well, that showcases that he was still able to get something done, and maybe if it had been someone that could have dealt with a Yamoja wall a little bit better, it could have helped him. That was the last pick, Mifflin, was this AMC. So they knew what they were getting into, they knew what they were locking up against, and yet it didn't end up working out that well for them. But like you said, stealing objectives left and right, for technically some of that game, felt like they were in an in-state until the Kings have a stellar defense that really, really kind of drives it back. And so you're in this weird middle ground. 
this weird no man's land. I think if you're the Kings, you're absolutely ecstatic because that was your game to win, and I would and you would have been pissed if you hadn't. Agreed. If you're the Bolts, it feels like it's this topsy turvy. Like, well, you were losing, but you were kind of winning, but you were losing, but then you were almost gonna win. And it feels like they kind of got the carpet yanked out from under them. Yeah, I, I think the Bolts, if if they're gonna evaluate that match, will just say to themselves, look. The fact that we were in that game post 10 minutes was thanks to objective steals that you can't <laughs> guarantee every single time. So I'd like to see wide sweeping changes from the Olympus Bolts draft, except for Lasbra. I think he had just a phenomenal yeah. performance. I mean, my guy was on a tear the entire time. Just a safer hunter, I think, is all the Bolts would have needed. Draft some pressure a little bit elsewhere on the map, and you'll be able to contend with the Kings a little bit more easily throughout the first 10 to 15 minutes of the match. Worth noting, though, the Olympus Bolts were ahead on Macro Farm for a significant portion of this game. Just before any fighting was happening, the Olympus Bolts had established about a 1,000, nearly 2,000 yeah. gold lead. That doesn't happen against the Camelot Kings. That does bode well for the Olympus Bolts if they could look towards maybe a draft that just scales well into the late game and slow down the pace of the Kings. Well, good news for them. They have a chance to prove it right here, right now. Picks and Bands game number two. The Bolts will be first pick this time, so opting, opting to, to swap sides. And now this is where things can get a little more interesting. Last time, the Bolts banned Artemis, Jingwei, and Bologna. And admittedly, with the Artemis coming in, outside of the Jingwei, at least it feels like Artemis and Bologna are, are going to work out pretty well. Netroid uh, is a little bit of a menace there on the Kings. The other side, it was Nox, Daji, and the Kepri. Wow. But no, they aren't going to go for the Jing here, Mifflin. Uh, honestly, Kind of surprises me. <laughs> Agreed. I, I had really expected the Bolts to be vying for Jingwei or at least force the Kings to ban it themselves, but instead, take it away. Could be a situation the Bolts are trying to pick up a Yamoja for themselves. The Kings have got yeah. one more ban, so that's available still. Fallbacks, Geb's been pretty popular. Capri's still incredibly strong. Both gods that the Bolts could take that would almost act as a, just another ban up against the Camelot Kings. You know Genetics likes playing those standards. And there goes my theory. They don't want the Yamoja either, the Bolts. They're just targeting all the best picks. And, you know, I'd have to go back and double check it. I think the Nox has still worked out really well for the Bolts, but I'm pretty sure every other mage support they've played this weekend has just been a loss for them. And, I, and I, admittedly, it's just yesterday's games. I would have to double check for that one. But it feels like something that maybe they, they need to, to rethink or, depending on the draft, uh, figure out where they're going to go. It's all small things like that, but again, an 0-8 performance on the Baron. I know yesterday the E-set looked completely out of place uh, in their game and so I, uh, against the Dragons there. So I think that there's definitely something that needs to be thought about maybe coming immediately from the duo lane as to what Jake is going to be bringing into this one. And they don't have the Nox. Now they don't have the Emoja. It's the first time I've ever been on a desk segment with you where I get to pull up the stats oh. first. So, in the last six <laughs> games for Awesome Jake, Guardians have looked a lot better for him. The Baron Somdi hey, and the Eset Windlock were evil. both losses. So, I'd like to see the Bolts get something a little bit more standard in their support role, or maybe even go back towards one of Jake's old bread and butters. A warrior, a, a tier, something along those lines could, I feel like, go a pretty long way for the Olympus Bolt, especially in 9-5. But instead, it's Olorun taken first overall. That's going to give the, the Kings a, a good amount of time to figure out counter selections. As you said earlier, it's generally been in the past. Cthulhu, Kamazots, the answers to this old run, both picks that we yeah. haven't seen a whole lot of so far this week. See. But there have been some other answers that have erupted onto the scene. Vamana jungle, I mean, it didn't look <laughs> awful. It performs similarly to Erlong Shen jungle. So if the Kings so choose, could look towards that god. That said, I don't think that Sanctified Field is such a strong tool that if the Kings are able to establish dominance elsewhere on the map, that Olderun is going to be enough to change the team fight on his own. So the Kings could just look towards finding some pressure around the Olderun and, well, essentially saying, well, you, you can't really use that ultimate offensively. It's mo mostly a defensive ultimate. So if the Kings yeah. establish the proactive pace, make it very difficult for this Olderun to play. Someone needs to tell Twitch. Like, usually it's in big red letters. I think I could even see it there, but like those those things say do not eat. <laughs> what was he eating? <laughs> That's like the, the hand warmers oh. like the, they use between games to keep their hands warm, right? Yeah, he, those are literally he's, toxic. He's, he was putting it in his mouth. Yeah, that is unlucky. Uh -oh. Twig, come on, man. <laughs> they need you right now. You can't be doing this. It's the Capri, the Chernabog locked in for the Kings. They go back to the King Arthur. This time, though, Mifflin, it is going to be a Guardian. You had just highlighted that it's been looking better Ice on the Guardians. Ymir has been locked in. And I want to say yesterday, I think we it was Mike that had played it, but I, specifically more Genetics is the one I want to talk about because Genetics, uh, a few days ago, like there were games, there were moments and plays where he's prolonging the game. He's making his team and giving them the opportunity to, to 
burn down fire giant timers win and get into a win state or at least a, a team fight state because of the Ymir walls he was placing. Not even just like, oh, I locked him away and we can pick up the kills, but blocking off objectives from them, slowing down towers, things like that. Uh, something that's a, a lot more passive of a Ymir play, but still something that has been pretty big the last few days. And in 9-5, considering how strong structures are, just being able to slow down some of those sieges has pretty massive value. I think Ymir, a phenomenal pick for the Olympus Bolts. It's Jake's third most played god this season. 11% of the time, Jake has gone towards this pick, so. Is that what it feels like when I do that? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was sick. That was cool. You're I'm cool, impressed man. with you. Yeah, that thanks, was awesome. man. So Ymir has <laughs> done pretty well for the Olympus Bolts. And looking at the draft already from the Kings, Chernabog, Capri, Bologna don't really have the greatest answers to Ymir. While sure, Bologna can get over with her ultimate. But if you have to use an ultimate, not exactly great. Chernabog similarly can get over with his <laughs> ultimate. We'll have to jump into the shadow of one of the enemies, which means that you're likely putting yourself even further out of position in those late game team fights. So... Ymir putting some decent pressure onto the Kings. But so far, looking at the Bolts draft, it's largely single target. Single target CC from King Arthur, single target damage from Oleron. Ymir can find multi-man freezes, but it's pretty unoften. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll see maybe two-man freezes uh, as one of the larger in a game. So lots of single target lockdown against a composition that has a single target revive. This Kepri is going to make it pretty hard for the Bolts to perform. I really like where some of these bands have ended up. Uh, you get the Nemesis and the Shibalanke banned out by the Kings. Again, allowing some of the other, like, quote-unquote top hunters, but with Artemis and Jingwei banned, and the fact that we just saw what can happen to an AMC, probably not feeling as confident Charybdis? about that one. Heimdall? Uh, Charybdis still available. Heimdall, Izanami was one that was banned last Hachiman? time around. That's still going to be available. <laughs> Hachiman. Turns out there's a lot of hunters oh, that, yeah. that are still pretty good. And so maybe not going to be the end of the world, but they didn't want to deal with the Darkest of Nights. Naja! Which normally I would be calling out like a I'm like confused saying what why is this here where you're like oh from? yeah it screams uh, and then I well yeah like, right it's the scarabs are playing but then it's like oh it's twig twig and specifically tings like to to come into that combination I mean it's not often that lately that we've seen it huh. but a lot of that naja plus ra naja plus kukul khan naja plus I'm gonna hit you with a really big fat ult and kill you has been their combo and so they strip that away. The Amus and Cobb gets picked up, but it feels more like a mid lane this time. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. AMC going to have great burst potentials. Has similar issues that it did last game for Barracuda in that Ymir is going to lock you down every single time. If you should decide yeah. to step up and apply Stinger, you're going to have a wall behind you and nowhere to walk. But Bastion of Safety again for the Camelot Kings. With this AMC now in the draft, you got to think that's where the target is. You, you, you say to yourself, well, that's the easiest guy to kill in the game, perhaps full stop. You have a Capri. Scarab's Blessing is going to have a pretty easy target every single time. This will leave Chernabog to his own devices in the back line more often than not. But as long as AMC is acting as that lightning rod, it should create a little bit of space for this Chernabog to perform. I, I, I really like this draft from the Camelot Kings. They've got good answers to auto attackers. Bologna with the Scourge going to deal with Oleron. Now Mercury as well. Even the Hachimon going to struggle once Bologna gets involved in these team fights. The Bolts really go all in on this single target DPS. Will help them out a lot around objectives. Mm -hmm. If the Bolts can be the proactive component around Gold Fury and Pyromancer, they'll shred them very quickly, and they've got great space control to make sure those objectives aren't getting stolen. But establishing a lead that will allow you to look for those objectives might be a little hard to come by with this draft. You've got Thanks decent gank potential. Surprise. Mercury with a sonic <laughs> boom. Large AoE or large... Global ultimate presence should be able to find targets like AMC isolated in the lane. But I, why am I talking about Mercury yeah. when Vamana's getting locked I, in? The only thing I have to say about this, then I'm going to let you just go off about it. But I called it. it. it, it really, well, not only did you call it. Uh, yesterday, Sharks had tweeted afterward that they were like, like he had been up from like 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. or something like that. And, and that now they were going into a game with a scrimless Vamana jungle. Do you think this one's also scrim? Like, do you think this is a, a inspired by the Valks pick? Am I thinking Captain Twig has played Vamana in? Well, he's scrims. definitely. Oh, okay. Just specifically in like the last like couple weeks, because like he's played forever. I'm so thinking like maybe the last couple years. Like he's definitely played 
a lot when of When was the last time like... Vamana was like an actual topic of conversation? Like in competitive Smite? Uh, season two? Was, was it Game Hunter? Tournament? Yeah. <laughs> was it, was it Game, Game Hunter? Hunter got a pentakill, and that was the last time Vamana was like yeah, it, big. It, it's been a while. I'm being told <laughs> season six by Blazy Bard, but I'm thinking he's making that up. So I'll that say. That was on Paladins. Yeah. yeah. Season six doesn't exist. Yeah, it wasn't, that wasn't Smite time. There's Look, no Warren Bossing. Vamana's got a great matchup in the Ola run. You can do exactly to what to Ola run what you, we saw happen to Barracuda on the Artemis. Olaron has no answer. You go into the Colossal Fury, he's just going to stick to you. Golden Blade yep. means that he's going to stick to you very easily as it's one of the largest infusions of movement speed you can get. Having a speed buff on top of that, I'm expecting yep. a very high octane performance from Vamana early on. Good news for Barra, though. He's got a dash. He's, he's got, got a dash. Ult. That boy is He's safe. not the target. <laughs> it's not yeah, him. He, he's not worried, though. <laughs> like, this is going to be the first game in, in the last two that we've gotten to see. I guess he's, he, he's going to be able to, to, to move around uh, a little happier. Is this Vimana, and you had mentioned it very similar to the Erlong is how you had worded it earlier, at least in terms of like where his powers are going to be, uh, and I guess gank capabilities as well. Although a blink, a blink knockup from a Vimana is kind of what old Erlong wanted to do more. He doesn't have the pin, but... At that point, you just beat him down. Yeah, I'm thinking Vamana is going to fill a very similar role to things like Shiva did okay. uh, in, in previous patches, where that early game is really, really hard to deal with. As long as that ultimate is available, he's just going to chase you down, and there's no way you can peel him off because he's got channeled CC immunity. And similar to Shiva in that in the absolute latest portion of the game, your ultimate kind of just doesn't have value. Yes, because at all. <laughs> everybody is just going to outbox you. You're just you slightly bigger now. Every single time. <laughs> and It's, it's going to allow you to keep moving forward. If you're already winning a team fight, Vamana and Shiva, great ultimates in the late game, because that way you can't peel them off. If you're behind or even, you're not winning DPS trades. You're not, you're not allowed to, to fully channel that ultimate. So keep your eyes on Vamana for the first 15 to 20 minutes of the game. That is exactly where he's looking to play. Otherwise, it's going to slow down. The only thing that causes me some interest about that one is that the Kings typically don't like playing for the first 15 minutes of the game. We'll see if they can do it here in game number two as we see if the Bolts can strike back or if the Kings will win this one 2-0. And it's going to be a big one. The winner of this next game could determine a lot about the rest of the day. The Kings are able to secure out this second point. They get moved into that winner side of the bracket whilst if the Bolts are able to strike back, they do have a chance at making the rest of the day a little bit easier for them. So, it's going to be down to, uh, well, to, to, to who of these two teams can beat it through. It will be Vamana here uh, in will the be. jungle on Captain Twig. And I'm going to ask you to, to, you know, elaborate on Mifflin's thoughts. Sure. I think Mifflin actually broke it down quite well. Bolts with a very heavy single target DPS team comp. That means they will blow up objectives quickly, but, you know, and if they catch an enemy god out, they can blow them up quickly as well. Although not blow them up, their burst damage is not crazy. It's just their high consistent damage. But then you have a Kepri on the other side of the on the other side of the, 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 the battleground, I guess, who can save a single target very quickly with his ultimate. So I guess I would almost say like Kepri is almost perfect into this Bolt's draft as well. So, and Vamana being an interesting choice, I think, you know, relatively good against Oleron. I'd say one of Oleron's counters, or at least a soft counter, probably not looking at the, the Hachiman too much, but if, he, if Vamana can get confident and stay confident with something like, you know, I, I guess a semi-bruiser build, and then also be ready with those genetic salts, he'll be able to you know, chase down this Oleron quite effectively, and he's not threatened by the Mercury too much either. It's just a matter of, you know, having a, a somewhat weak gank, I would call it. You know, he has nothing that's really going to lock down the enemy team by, you know, any CC. It's just a small slow, and then he can chase them down on that. So I would imagine King's scaling a little bit here, and Olympus Bolts maybe trying to push the pressure on as soon as possible with their objective DPS comp. Looks like he's uh, going into that attack-based yep. build we've been seeing for the rest of the week, starting off with the Eye of the Jungle, moving into probably the Golden Blade here. I, I, I want to ask, though, are we expecting typically with, with Vamana when we have seen it, it's been in combination with Frostbound meta or even sure. sometimes the the hastened Katana. We're uh, just seeing so much movement speed now yeah. in, in, in these jungle builds. So, you know, honestly, he could still go a Witchblade if he wants more movement speed. He could go hastened Katana if he needs it. But the Oleron, I suppose Jake does have a sprint, so he may need some more, you know, movement speed or, or something to catch his opponent. So I wouldn't recommend something like a Frostbound just because Jake has that sprint to counter already. If he wants to keep up with them, sure, you can go hasten Katana, but that's not a very high damage item. In my opinion, Twig should just try to get a couple hits in that ultimate, which will give him more movement speed every time he gets one of those auto attacks on during his ultimate, and then he'll be able to keep up with his target. I doubt Venenu will be able to get away very easily, because Jake really has no peel for a Vamana either, unless they can, you know, give him a Cursed Ankh, so they're able to turn it on Vamana and kill him. 
because otherwise it's really only a wall from Jake, which Vimana can walk right through in his ultimate. And there is no cast dunk at the moment, so potentially seeing that picked up at level 12 here from awesome Jake. Maybe Haddix as well has space for it in his build. Just looking for someone to pick up some form of anti-heal. And I expect we will see a lot of anti-heal on the side of Olympus Bolts. Yeah, what I want to see from Addicts this game is to basically bully and, and, and force Genetics away from being able to ult his divers. So we're going to see Variety and Captain Twig and maybe even Netroid diving into the enemy backline this game. And if Genetics is there ready to back them up with an ultimate, that can be really effective. But if, if Haddix can take Genetics up in the air, for example, or force him out by just you know the sheer ability of, of being able to zone him through damage, then that could remove the ability for him to get a good ultimate in the enemy backline where it would be most valuable. I am surprised that Etroid has been allowed to play this Chernobog again. He made yeah. such fantastic use of it in that last game, just being present throughout all forms of the map. But Jake clearly, and uh, sorry, the rest of the bolts clearly thinking that the, the answer to that Chernobog is the Ymir or something else on this team that we have yet to see be utilized. So we'll have to see how that works out. And also, they just have some other high-value bands. I think they've been away. Artemis, Jingwei, those are two very mm. good hunters. There's just a lot of good hunters right now. And then, of course, after last game, they have to ban away the Emoja because there's no way yeah. Jake wants to play into that again. He did not have a very fun time last game. And if he was on this Ymir again into a Yamoja, he would not be having a fun game in this game either. We'll likely still have to pay the Ymir tax, though. This character very susceptible to yes, yes. being ganked and, and being picked off the board, but maybe the easiest character we see on the side of the Olympus Bolts to kill, other than maybe Venenu for Captain Twig. You know, it doesn't, yeah, yeah. as you mentioned, doesn't have the self-peel potential when Twig is in that CCI ultimate. But Jake is going to be in a bit of a vulnerable position, especially if Twig is able to make that rotation over to the left-hand side. This is, this is that fake Haddix, not Haddix, but the fake King Arthur damage that we see in the solo lane, just getting a lot of poke, trying to force Variety out, so he has a harder time clearing the clearing the waves, and all that really does is, like, because I don't think Variety's even going to get pushed under the tower, he'll clear just on his tower line. All that does is give Haddix the pressure to basically clear first so they have space around their blue buff, and also have that pressure on the totem as well. But, you know, the, the consequence, I suppose, of pushing a, a Bologna back into the enemy tower, into their tower, is that there's no real room for a Mercury ultimate there, so Lazbra, no, no opportunity there, just goes to secure the blue buff, and it's going to be completely even early game. So a pretty slow one, but we'll maybe see it speed up a little bit, see if Jake can steal this red buff. I do like the idea, though, from Lazbro, though, to just Always go check. around and, and, and check. Just yeah. make sure that Variety's not stepping up too far. Speaking of stepping up, though, Jake coming up here to the red buff. Just going to freeze BMT for good measure, but Netroid uses that ultimate just in case there's any extra aggression from the Olympus Bolts. And I like that. It's too pronged, too. It gets him back to lane a little yeah. bit faster. He's not too worried about using that cooldown. But with it down, it does open up the Scorpion for the Olympus Bolts. That's a bonus to that Mercury DPS. They're able to take that Scorpion down pretty quickly. But Jake being slightly out of position here, pops the sprint and should be able to walk away. Lazbra is going to get pressured out by Variety. He did think about using the ultimate to separate out that team fight, but not quite wanting to commit it just yet. Five minutes in. Maybe a little early for the Sonic Boom. No real damage coming here from Lazbra. Just has that Golden Blade online. So the Claire's online, but no Rage, no uh, Stone Cutting Sword, nothing really damaging from the Mercury. Yeah, but all he needs right now is just enough to kill those Scorpions, and that's what he is doing. So a small goal lead for the Olympus Bolts. Not going to matter too much, just about 500 XP completely even, just because it's a, well, these lanes are relatively even. But the Gold Fury, I mean, the, not the Gold Fury, the Scorpions being an advantage will give them some buffed buffs, I guess you would call it, enhanced buffs is what I would say, I suppose. So that blue buff going to be a little bit more effective on Haddix, so that cooldown will help him in this, you know, poke trade. Heading back just to the neutral now, six minutes into the game, no action really to speak of. Slow this one. time last game, we did at least see a little bit of action around that blue buff, but... A little bit slower. The Camelot Kings want to take it a little bit more relaxed this time around. They have a lot more, I would say, scaling into that late game through BMT and Netroid. Want to just help them get to that place a little bit more comfortably. I do worry, though, Ro, that they're letting Lazbro and Venenu get up to that late game, too, a little bit easily. They are, but, you know, Kings don't have too much early pressure themselves. We can see in the solo lane, Haddix kind of just blowing out this this Bologna. While nothing much comes of it, it does nullify what this Bologna would normally do in most lanes, which is, like, invade blue buffs like they tried to at the start. And the Mercury, with his fast jungle clear as well, he's able to just be everywhere he needs to be at the right time, even going to mid camps over his speed buff to just, just to secure that neutral farm to make sure his team stays in the lead or at least doesn't fall behind. 
some aggression in the mid lane. Captain Twig rotates through and does miss the Umbrella Rang onto Laz Pro. So no followed up aggression there. Everyone's just going to go back to farming. It's it's a slow one, bro. Slow I, I, I don't know what to, uh, to tell you. Are you noticing anything interesting here about the builds from the two teams? No, not much about the builds. We do see two we do see two Sovs on the side of Olympus Bolts, but that's just because Sovereignty is so good in this whole lane. Just getting that sustain from that HP5 and obviously the physical defense against the two physical gods that will be hitting him is basically the best item in that slot right now. And as well, Jake being a relatively vulnerable god on Ymir as well, I think it's better for him to get the early protections in a flat protection item that is Sovereignty instead of to go for stacks for something like Thebes. So a smart pickup from him, whereas we see Genetics on the other side scaling his builds. In fact, we're seeing a lot of... Uh, uh, stacking items on the side of King, so they clearly just want to scale to this, you know, mid-game fight potential where they have this Vamana chase down. We are seeing Captain Twig get some more movement speed online, so he'll be able to chase down this um, Oleron on Venenu pretty soon. But again, he's going to have to contest with those Sovereignty protections, that sprint as well. So we'll see how effective he truly can be. Has that second thousand fold blade online? So a couple different options for Twig here. Probably will be the stone cutting sword if I He's imagine damaged, correctly. Yeah. yeah. Gets a little bit of protections away from the Olympus bolt, so that's going to make it a little bit easier for him to start chewing through some people, which I think at this point might be uh, well. Once that item's finished up, might be the time we start seeing the kings getting aggressive in some of these lanes. Once Twig has that kill potential online, we are seeing a trebuchet come up the left lane. I don't imagine Netroid, he's got full stacks now, shouldn't have too much trouble dealing with that. It is notable that he has full stacks well and truly before Barracuda does. Um, I don't think that has too much to do with anything apart from Barracuda just staying in lane longer and not getting as inefficient back off. Or maybe a more efficient uh, move for Barracuda, getting more of that farm. He is slightly ahead, although Netroid is yet to clear that wave. And we'll see how he can deal with the trebuchet as well. I think it's going to be a little bit difficult. He will take a little bit of damage to that tier 1 tower, surely. No one coming over here to the left-hand side to help. Jake, though, is Some looking for that lane, coming to deal a little bit of extra to Netrioid. Push him while he's down. He's getting very aggressive, playing right up at that tower line. They don't want Netrioid to come anywhere near this trebuchet, and for good reason. The thing is doing a fair amount of damage to the tower. Look at that, three shots in. Already just above half HP. Ro, if they can continue just denying Netrioid the space here, this could be a trebuchet. free kill. Even make him take a tower shot. The trebuchet gets the tier one. It should, it does. So King's not too concerned by that. Genetics only rotating very slowly, and I believe he was just there to protect Netroid more so than the tower. To be fair, Netroid are relatively is on a relatively safe guard, is able to dash into the walls, go up in the air and fly away if he needs to. But a, a good trebuchet play from, from Jake, I would say, to just go over there, make sure they secure that pressure. And, and if Genetics was to rotate in sooner, maybe they could have fought for the 2v2. But honestly, I'd give the 2v2 advantage to Jake and Barracuda at this point. And I guess a gold advantage soon to the Bolts, because they are pretty freely getting this Pyromancer. Yeah, they got a tower for free. Now they're getting a Pyromancer for free. This is a really decent lead that the Olympus Bolts are starting to draw up. About 3,000 gold on the board, just below. Uh, sorry, 2,000. I, I yep. added a whole extra number there to the front. But that is still a, a very respectable lead here 10 minutes into the game. And it's something that the Olympus Bolts can definitely build off. It gives us an interesting look at King's you know, mental state right now or, or the way they are seeing this game. So they're not too concerned. They're not really reacting to this tier one push on the left. They didn't really react to Pyromancer. So they feel one of two ways. Number one, we're just scaling. We're not too concerned about a small gold lead. It isn't going to make a difference once it gets to the mid game. Or number two, we feel like we're really lacking pressure here and we cannot fight them in this stage. So. Either one, I think that we're going to a later mid-game at the very least. But if Olympus Bolts can keep up this pressure and, and try to keep up this pace, maybe force a Gold Fury soon, maybe even now, it looks like Haddix is... Yeah, he's TPing back to the right lane, never mind. I thought he might have been TPing towards the Gold Fury. So not forced just yet, not feeling that confident just yet. No, that, that Gold Fury does still do a lot of damage. Really does throw hands here in 9.5. So not something that the Olympus Bolts can do as flippantly as they would like. Any sort of response from the Camelot Kings could be disastrous, as we saw in last game spot. on the flip side. But yeah, absolutely, Twig he is in a pretty weird spot. Does still have the ultimate available to him, but that's going to be the last brawl off the mark. Yeah. Twig able to get out of the way just before Sonic Boom comes offline. Lazbro missing his dash as well, although Haddix did lift him up before that. He probably would have hit it if Haddix didn't lift him, but then missing the ultimate. So it's just a free escape from Captain Twig. He didn't even need to expend his ultimate there. I imagine if he really needed to, he could have just altered and walked out of there with that extra movement speed, but a decent commitment from Lazbro, but both missing the mark. 
now just back to the neutral palm <laughs> row. Everyone's Didn't just uh, continuing to slap each other up. Variety is going to fall surprisingly low here, but not a uh, not a worry for Variety here. That this is just solo laner shenanigans. So yeah, yeah. I don't and think he's going to be too concerned. This is what Variety should expect as well. We're going a, thri a triple defense, physical defense item on um, on Haddix because he's all up against physical defense on the other side. So a really hard lane for Variety to win when he's up against that much of physical defense. So he's just going to be fine. He'll, he'll he'll be effective in team fights with his disarm on Mercury, this Oloron, and, and this Hachi Man. So as long as he can make it out of that lane relatively even without being too far behind, he's fine. Finally a first. Big grouping from the Camelot Kings here on the left-hand side. Twig blinking forward, looking to find some damage, but he's still half HP. And I don't think much is going to come from that. The Camelot Kings see Venenu rotate through, and they go, you know what? We, we signed up for a 2v4, not a 2v3. We're going to back off. We don't want to fight in that sanctified field. And that's once again the aggression curtailed off. The Camelot Kings, they do not want anything to do with aggression. Yeah, I, I, again, it's hard to read how they're thinking right now. Maybe they see the shell and the sprint popped and they say, well, we've got enough. We've got the value out of this so far. They only expended one blink on the side of Captain Twig, so maybe they're just willing to take that trade. Or maybe, like I said before, they're just waiting for the late game. You know, any any moment of, of silence and, and you know PvE combat instead of PvP is better for the Kings because they seem confident that their team fight is just going to be better. Their scaling is just going to win them this game. But on the side of the Olympus bots, they've still got the all or all, you know, maybe the Ymir won't be too effective because you can dash into walls if you're Netroid. It's just if he catches, if that Ymir wall catches Big Man Tings, for example, who doesn't have his shell upgraded yet, then we could see a kill. But it's really difficult for a Ymir to be able to catch a Hunter like that in the back line. I really got to ask you here, Ro. We, we were hearing, hearing the desk talking about Vamana's kind of fall off after that first kind of 12, 15 minutes. Really has a lot of damage in that early game. We haven't really seen Twig use that very much. Are we worried that he's going to fall off into that late game? Yeah, I wouldn't say I agree with him falling off around that point. Where I think he struggles is when an Ankh is on the enemy team. So if Jake does decide, once he's level 12, does decide to go for that Ankh, then Vamana is in trouble because he cannot fight when he's anti-healed like that. And that extra damage he'll take during his ultimate will make him very squishy. So as long as that's not an issue he's going to run, in with, run into, then he'll be fine in this team comp, in this situation. But if he does run into that, then he has to be very careful with his ultimate. I'm not surprised to, to see him not get very active in the early game. He doesn't really have targets apart from Oleron in the mid lane that he can chase down easily. And you can't chase an Oleron under tower in this patch. He's just got to wait for Oleron to walk into the jungle like he is now and try to fight him around an objective. And the objective it does look like the current objective for the Olympus Bolts here. Grouping up around that gold Might fury. Just be gone. Jake just has so much presence, and the Camelot Kings aren't able to make it to the objective before it's finished up. Jake takes a little bit of damage with the ice shards. Gonna stop him from getting picked up, and the Camelot Kings once again, not even caught sleeping, Row, but Jake showing so much presence. A great wall to peel off that. I think it was the Kepri and, and Netroid back there. Netroid could fly if he wanted to, but instead he'll keep it, get the vision for his team so his team can start a Pyromancer, but I don't think they can do it in front of Haddix right now. Potentially not. No, there is a lot of auto attack damage, and the landing down from the Camelot, uh, from the Bolts isn't quite gonna take that one off. Righty, once again, Lazra off the mark with the ultimate, but a three man stun from Haddix. Not much follow up to be heard of. Two people caught out in the sanctified fields. Venenu finds them, but the wall from Jake stops BMT and genetics from getting out, and it's there for so long. The Scarab's blessing is gonna pull Big Man Ting straight back into four, and awesome Jake with a beautiful wall. What a wall from him. It's not easier to catch an enemy hunter in the back line and wall behind them especially, so really punishing AMC for being immobile here, something we saw Barra face in the last game with the Emojo ults, and apparently this gives them enough confidence at 16 minutes to pull an objective because Chernobog does not have his ultimate to fly over. Wow, Variety stepping up, but he is all alone. Scratch Twig that. Ultimate. Twig is on his way here. We might be able to see the first big baby of the game, and there it is. Up, down, Variety looking to find some damage Barracuda could be the target, but so far, Captain Twig just storming through, trying to find some stuff. Barracuda could fall down here, but the rest of the team rally up around the Hunter. And it's going to be two more kills in favor of the Olympus Bolts, but they did their job. The Warriors from the Camelot Kings able to stop this attempt at the Fire Giant by the Bolts. The important thing for Kings, that means no Fire Giant. You're right. So, and Netroid was able to farm that entire time as well. Not getting a gold lead himself, or not getting a, an XP lead himself, because Barracuda was able to be in that fight and find some kills and assists. So, 
I guess just completely nullified it again. We saw Pyromancer go the way of the Kings. We saw Gold Fury go the way of the Bolts, and a couple of kills exchanged as well. But we saw how effective that Vamana roll as well was, because Jake still doesn't have that Ankh. We still don't know if he will, he will go for it, and if he doesn't, that Vamana ult will continue to be that effective going into the later game. The one thing he has to watch out for is not having any magical defense into Venenu. That's where he could struggle, and that's where he could take a lot of damage. And I, I gotta ask, Ro, like, what really is the alternate option for Jake here in that second relic slot? If not the Ankh, then what would he rather go for? Yeah, uh, look, I just hope he goes for the Ankh. I think that is the way to go in this situation. I'm not sure there is another option. Yeah, I mean, you could buy something like a shell if you want a third one, and you could just say, you know what, we've got three, yells, sh three shells, and if we use them... Three yells. Yeah. Help, help, help! That, well, exactly, that's what Barracuda is saying, and that's what Venena will be saying. But if you can use three yell uh, three shells consecutively, <laughs> that maybe will absorb all of those Vamana auto attacks. So that could help. But honestly, I'd rather just see the Ankh. I can't imagine you know, using a Frenzy, maybe a Sunder, something to blow him up faster. But the Ankh is just most effective of that out of anything. Instead, yes, yeah, okay, he's gone for it, and he's upgraded his, wing his hastened wings as well. Yeah, the, so the, the smart play from Awesome Jake, absolutely. Not really another option that he could take in good conscience there. Yunk will be picked up, and as you mentioned, the sprint as well. So a lot more utility on the table now from the Olympus Bolts to deal with the one successful engagement that the, the, the Kings were able to find in which Twig was able to pop off. So yeah. now that that Unk's on, on the discussion... Even harder. Yeah, for, for sure. Twig's going to find it very difficult to come into this game. That level 12, really uh, a big thing. And I think maybe that's that, that does harken back to, to what Mifflin was saying. Yeah, yeah, maybe the level off. 12 drop-off for... Uh, yeah, uh, that's Twig what, being uh, on the support level side. Level 12s. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. So, I mean, he could get an ultimate off and try to force that Ankh and kind of, kind of reset and then get another one ult, uh, another ult off before that Ankh is back up. That's a play that he can make. But again, you know, one of those ults at least is going to be completely nullified by that relic of Jake. As long as Re Jake has is around, first of all, and two, has good use of it. I think the, the Haste and Wings is a good a pickup as well, because correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the one that gives... Uh, free movement ability to his hunters and, and I guess Mercury as well when they land those auto attacks. So Venenu might be able to just backpedal it and kite around in his ultimate at a very fast movement speed with that Haste and Wings and just kind of outrun Captain Twig. So that could be a great move by Jake and, and two counter relics for this Vamana could almost completely nullify him. Now that is a big investment to counter just one god on the enemy team, but that's what you have to do as a support sometimes. So in my opinion, a great move by Jake, two great pickups. Yeah, no, absolutely, and you are correct yes. there on the sprint. It, does, it will give everyone on the team haste. So that will give Venenu, as you mentioned, some extra space to move with against Captain Twig. Camelot Kings, though, still super quiet here. They have slipped back into a, uh, a 4K deficit, which at 20 minutes really isn't all Not that big of a deal. Um, it definitely will translate to a half item here, a, 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 one, a tier one item there. But nothing so solid for the moment. The Camelot Kings, not in the worst position, could definitely get worse if they give up this Oni Fury like they have other Furies. A lot of DPS on the side of Bolts as well. So if Jake can find a similar wall to what he found last time and is able to just zone the enemy team off, even for, for five seconds, I would say, then they're able to blow up an objective. But maybe looking to blow up Captain Twig here. Potentially, but Anu has a lot of damage, but he's able to just rub his face against this wall. That thing is there for so long. Twig, half HP, has to back away. Now the Olympus Bolts with a man advantage, able to start up the Oni Fury, and it's shredded so quickly. Look at that wall comes through, Variety can't even think about it. Camelot Kings are able to pick up the Pyromancer in trade, but I mean, if I'm looking at Pyro or Oni Fury, I know which one of them I would rather take. Of course, now you're getting these Oni waves. We've got a Trebuchet as well that could be moved out of the base. So now the pressure for this Fire Giant comes on for the Olympus Bolts. The Variety gets knocked up, knocked back down, potentially more damage to come through, but Again. they don't want to commit too heavily onto Variety. The Olympus Bolts playing this game super patiently only really putting in the exact amount they need to. Yeah, I mean, they don't need to kill Variety. He does have the teleport, so maybe if there's any god they need to kill on the enemy team, it is him, so he can't teleport back in. But the important part is, off this you know, freeze, off this wall, or whatever kind of CC they have on this front line, like the Vamana we saw near the Gold Fury, if they can poke him out, that's all the space they need for an objective. And when they have this much objective DPS, you know, they really don't need much more than that. They just need five seconds, like I said to themselves without uh, like a ballooner or a, of a mana crashing in and they can blow up an objective relatively effectively. The one thing we haven't seen is bolts fully commit and that's because there's a Capriol on the other side, you know, mm -hmm. they don't want to just fully commit a bunch of ultimates into a Capriol and then get turned on. So we'll see if, if genetics can make a big play with that ultimate later in the game.
just now returning back to the neutral farming game. The Camelot Kings and the Olympus Bolts are moving closer towards this fire giant though, but Genetics caught out, so is Captain Twig, oh. and the knockup from Haddix causes them to take so much damage. The turnaround potentially there, but up into the Colossal Fury, Captain Twig goes. Nothing really to gain from it though. The Olympus Bolts force a very big ultimate from the uh, from the Kings. Yeah, Kings are in a tough spot right now. Completely zoned out. Basically, we want not very useful at all in this team fight. But it's they're going to go all in on this fire giant by the looks of it. They are baiting in a little bit. They're ready to turn on somebody. Let's we'll see what target they choose. They don't want to commit fully. Instead, three it's people all. line up for Lazarus ultimate. The sanctified field slows them down long enough. But Lazarus getting turned on, and now he's the first death of the engagement. So Genetics split. is able to find Barracuda. And the beads are popped, but can he make it out? Is the Question, uh, Scarra's Blessing saves the life of the support, but Para falls down here too, Ro. And what what happened? I would call that a good engage on part of Lazra, but this team is just split because Captain Twig and Variety are kind of in the backline annoying the enemy backline, so they're not able to nullify, or not able to capitalize, sorry, on that big Mercury ultimate. Two people stunned out. Up, down from Variety, finds Venenu and Awesome Jake, and now the damage is coming through. Venenu falls down. Jake oh has God. a very long way to go before he's in safety, and instead will find himself on the grayscale. This is a fantastic position for the Camelot Kings. Haddix, the only man left standing. We saw Lazper do it last game. Can <laughs> Haddix steal it away this time around? He's Variety says no. Okay, smart by Variety. They learned their lesson. You know, yeah. let's get some zoning going on, making sure there's no chance we get this objective stolen away from us. Captain Twig will have to go back and clear that trebuchet up, but after that, I imagine they'll push down these towers, get a little bit of global gold for themselves, and put themselves, well, they're already in the lead, but they'll put themselves even further in the lead. And now, I think they feel confident in their team fight. They're at the point where they're gonna have a lot of global gold, a big advantage in terms of XP, because Genetics, most importantly, will be able to upgrade his relic and able to reduce the damage on his team. So this, you know, suddenly single target damage on the side of Bolts is gonna really struggle to kill a single target on the side of Kings. They already had to put up with that Kepriol, and now they're gonna have to put up with higher base protections as well. The one win condition that, that I see for Bolts is that to catch out Captain Twig again would be really important. Still, no magical defense at all, so Venenu will shred through him, but Venenu quite behind himself. You know, only level 18, died twice, hasn't got his items online just yet. He will get percentage penetration soon, but that won't help too much up against Captain Twig. Every single game, it feels like we have seen the Camelot Kings behind. They found themselves in this position. It only takes these guys one fight to turn it's things they like around. To be, it, seems. It, it, it does seem that way. They like playing this game from behind. 22 minutes go by, Ro, without a single drop of gold in favor of yeah. the Camelot Kings. And then suddenly one engagement and that cliff, that nosedive of gold and experience now swinging 10,000 in their favor. It's like they just let it trickle out of their favor a little bit because they know the fights aren't in their favor at all. And then as long as they hold on and just wait for the enemy team to kind of get overconfident. Maybe that's by design from Kings, you know, give some confidence to the enemy team, but just slowly, slowly get to that late game. As long as you're not losing too much in the early game, then they're completely confident going into the late game with a, a 5k deficit. And we saw that in this this team fight near this Fire Giant. They were not in the lead at all. And, and we saw a great Mercury ultimate and get, able to get a great engage, but Kings completely confident in their team fight despite missing a Vermana roll and still able to win it and, and win it heavily as well. Four kills on the side of Kings in that engagement. And now they're looking to set up for the, the Gold Fury. They've got two tier two towers down. The only structures left on the map for the Olympus Bolts are the two towers in the right lane and then the birds themselves. And you know what? I think even if the Camelot Kings aren't able to get anything else off of this Fire Giant, I think they're more than happy with this. They turn the pace of the game on its head. That's right. They reverse the lead. They get a lot of map control in form of those two towers. And now they can set up for the next Fire Giant, which will spawn in just a few minutes. They do still have a, a minute and a half left on this FG buff. And, and we're seeing this grouping on the right hand side yeah. to try and knock down these towers. So even further, they're going to push this lead. Yeah, probably around 8k by, by the end of it, and that will give them enough confidence. It'll be interesting to see how they position around the next Fire Giant. It looks like Bolts might be trying to defend this Tier 2 on the right side, but I imagine they'll just back out. Maybe Jake will buy some time with the wall, absorb some of those auto attacks. But Variety is completely ready to fight. He is already looking at the back line. And I love that highlight there from Doug, the uh, Emperor's armor coming through from Captain Twig. Yep. Such a... It'll it, help. I like it. I re it's got health, it's got physical defense, and it'll make this... Uh, 
Tower Siege a whole lot easier. There is an Emperor's Armor on the enemy team too, but Captain Twig gets caught out, steps up against the wall. Asper is sitting here, charging ultimate, freeze. trying to find some stuff. Really good freeze, but there's wow. no follow-up for it, Ro. Netroy took zero points of damage in a full Ymir freeze. That's quite unfortunate. I imagine, well, I would have hoped to see Barracuda shoot some long-range auto attacks, maybe get a couple crits, and that would have forced the Kings out. But I think Bolt's just buying time right now. I, I can't imagine they really want to fight this full 5v5. They do have the help of their Tier 2 tower, but it's not going to be here long. And the zoning from Variety is so good. Up and down for Captain Twigs running into Vanenu. Nearly Die. falls down, but there's going to be the Unk. But the save from Genetics keeps his jungler alive and in the fight. What a beautiful Scarif Blessing. Does exactly what they need it to. Captain Twig blinks forward, gets the space, and then gets evac'd by Genetics. Yeah, very good comp by design. Just see Quig, Twig can be as confident as he needs to be. He forces a lot of cooldowns. That sprint, that Unk from Jake straight away. Mm. Vinedu having to act defensively, ulting down his lane, using that beads, using that shell, and I think Barracuda even using a shell at the same time for him as well, yes. So, a big expenditure just based on a, a decent Vamana blink ult, and then a great Kepri ult as well from Genetics. So that's what you see when you have no no execute on the, the other side. So he able to get very effective ultimates and and Twig getting a lot of a lot of use out of his ultimate as well. So I imagine King should be pretty confident taking this next fight as long as they don't get caught out here by a wall. This Fire Giant will most likely be enhanced by the time either of these teams be, is yeah. able to pick it up. A minute and a half left, spawning in about 15. Yeah, I would say pretty confidently the Enhanced yeah. Fire Giant will be the next big objective. And we've seen Camelot Kings' as prowess in terms of fighting over this objective pressure. The Fire Giant Dance may be one of the King's biggest idea. strengths. I think they should also just be pulling the trigger soon, maybe baiting themselves by a little bit of Ymir Walls because we still no defensive relics at all, apart from on King Arthur and Mercury available on the side of a Olympus Bolt, so I would say now is the King's chance, but as we know, they are not a team to rush anything. Absolutely not. Cool, calm, and measured variety. If you get knocked up there, and we'll take a few shots from Barracuda, but that Spectral Armor will keep him safe for now. Those crits not quite doing as much as they would to the rest of his team. Lasbro looking for this rotation around the left-hand side, and that's where the, the value of the Spectral is going to come into play here, Ro, with both Lasbro yeah. And uh, and Barracuda building these crits. Yeah, I mean, it makes it really easy for him to itemize. And honestly, a balloon are a great pick into that as well. So you've got the, you know, the block stacks on your one, and that reflects damage also. You've got the disarm on the three, and then you've got block stacks, which don't completely block auto attacks anymore on the Nemean Lion. And then obviously the reduced damage of the Spectral Armor. So pretty tanky. He's able to be pretty confident. He shouldn't ever be the one getting the, the Capriols. So it just leaves them for Captain Twig, which is perfect for him. Big Man Tings does get stunned out there by Haddix's ultimate, but no follow-up yet again. The Olympus Bolt's not really following Hunting. up a lot in these fights. And now look at the damage coming through. Jake potentially Jake caught out here, but this wall stopping Genetics from engaging. But the damage suddenly pulls through onto Jake. And down falls the Ymir, up and down. Two people hit. Haddix, forced the beads. Genetics onto the horse. Venenu does pop that sanctified field, but the damage is still coming through to him. It's down he baby. falls. Captain Twig chews through one, chews through two. Barracuda falls down, and now it's just Lazar and Haddix to defend the Titan. And that's all it took, just a bit more confidence out of the end of Kings. They're able to catch Jake out, a, a very immobile Ymir. And Jake, on his death, falls away and is squeezed out. His relics are squeezed out. He, he sprints, he unks, and all of a sudden this unk is no no longer a problem for Captain Twig, so he's able to just go big baby, walk that Vermana, uh, walk that Vermana right down the lane and, and clean him up. Five man strong, they're still looking for the damage. Sonic Boom finds Netrioid, but it's too little, too late. The Titan falls down and the Camelot Kings in a 2-0 victory will move on to the winner's side. A dominant performance out of Kings today. Completely patient in their early games, not pushing their luck at all. You know, they know they're strong, they know they're confident in the late game, and just, you know, the, the composure to just go through the early game, slowly losing gold and not panic at all, panicking at all, and then just the execution of these team fights. They haven't faulted at all today. Yeah, it's just been exactly as you said, measured, I think really is has the, been. the word of the day for yeah. the Camelot Kings. This team, they have no reason and no desire seemingly to go any further than they absolutely have to, That's and right. they wait super patiently for that moment to chip through the armor. And it's really difficult sometimes in teams to keep the leash on certain players that might feel ambitious. Maybe they want to go for this gank, this crazy dive, but the Kings, you see none of that. They just mm. stay measured, like you say, and it's so cool, calm, and collected. That's really impressive stuff, especially in a high-pressure environment that is Masters. Well, it is indeed high-pressure, but let's break down that victory from the Kings with the desk. Takes them a little while to get there, Mifflin. But they end up finding themselves a 2-0 victory here. Oh, 
over the Bolts. The Kings get to move forward. Now, for those of you who are Bolts fans, I'm going to preface all of this. They're not out yet, so you will be able to see them a little bit later today. That yet is maybe the word that is necessary. <laughs> Things uh, not looking great for them. They have one more chance later to continue on in the tournament, but if they lose that set, they're gone. Kings, on the other hand, are one step closer to the finals, and, and Mifflin, they look just impeccable doing so. I feel like the Kings, maybe more than any other team in the league right now, have just got such a solid grasp on what 9-5 is. Like, their yes. drafts are clean, the pacing in their game is incredibly clean. One thing has taken a slight dive for the, for the Kings, and it's their early game farming macro play. Yet again, we're 12 minutes in the game. The Olympus Bolts essentially have about a 3,000 gold lead, 0-0 zero to zero in the slash lines. But when the Bolts got their lead, it's an issue that had reared its head back when this was a renegade squad. It's an issue when the Bolts were just brand new to being Bolts. They get their lead, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And in giving up all that time, the Camelot Kings say, well, your 3,000 gold lead hasn't extended, and all of a sudden, the team fight of our composition has gotten to a point where we can perform. And it really just made it pretty difficult for the Olympus Bolts to do a whole lot on the map. I would have liked to see them push their lead a little bit more so. The Camelot Kings, on the other hand, just playing perfectly. The casters did a great job highlighting their unwillingness to make mistakes. They just go as far as they need to. They play as safe as they need to. It feels like there's like a, a checklist for the Camelot Kings. Get to this point in the game, 10 minutes in, now we can start fighting. Or, hey, now that this guy's level 15, we can start playing around him. And the Kings won't do anything until they meet those criteria. Once they do, pretty hard team to beat. And well, hey, they, they make it to that point. Uh, you had mentioned I think going into this, the first 15 minutes being very important, and then, in, and, you know, for the first 15 minutes, there wasn't a fight. And then, uh, as you had highlighted, there were, it was a massive gold lead that, that goes in favor of the Bolts. The first fight of this game is a four-for-one trade in favor of the Bolts. Normally, like on the uh, especially with buff. how well that ends up going for you, uh, we're used to seeing that uh, get out of hand really quickly. Typically, objectives afterward clean and smooth sailing from that point forward. It is resilience, is I think, the word I would use for the Kings here. Going through that, going through a gold deficit, and then the next fight, Yikes. and then the next fight. That third fight, though, uh, well, that one was theirs. I mean, damage numbers on the Bolts. Not uh, good. Very specifically, the Mercury. Yeah. Incredibly low compared to what I had expected. And the other side, you get to see them all up in the, the 10,000 digits. But what is most impressive to me, I think has to be this Vomana because we were looking at it and admittedly it feels like those first 15 are where he should flourish. And Twig said, screw that, I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna make him look great in the late game when the ult is useless. I'm gonna get cursed onked and I'm not gonna care. I'm still gonna find these kills. And you know what, if you're able to do so, then do it, I guess, because they find themselves a 2-0. They're going to be moving forward to the third set of the day. Next up, we're going to be watching the Titans take on the Dragons. Winner will play the Kings. Whoever wins that set, I'm talking match 33 here, they go straight to the grand finals. No questions asked. They just get to go there and relax tomorrow morning. The loser will then drop down into that match 35 slot and wait for the winner of match 34. 34's loser goes home, 35's loser goes home, and then we get a grand finals victor from that point forward. So we've only got two more matches where you can you know, avoid elimination. Cor, how do you keep getting it, man? Losing grand finals, you get to go home. It's well, about yeah, the negativity. Oh, you're right. It's about spreading <laughs> Who cares hatred. about the guy that wins? Yo, we're not talking about who wins. It's inflicting <laughs> Loser losses. Loser getting your money and That's a trophy right. and feeling all good about you and your team. Get out of here. <laughs> Look at this guy's crying. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. What? You said it's about hatred. You got to like is. dial it, it up to 11. God, I do love hatred. <laughs> yeah. That's the, okay. That's the clip. I want that one. <laughs> That one, that's a good quote to have. <laughs> just like myth quotes throughout there. And it's just, God, I love hatred. Well, that's going to do it for this set. Kings find themselves a 2-0. We'll see the Bolts a little bit later today. We're going to go on forward with the Titans and Dragons right after this.